afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 12710 in the name of Shona Robinson on health and social care integration. I'd invite all members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And without further ado, call on Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson to speak to and move the motion. 14 minutes, please. Mr. Presiding Officer, and uh, I'm very pleased to open this debate today on integration of health and social care. Very timely as we move towards the new world of integration from the, the 1st of April. I was uh, Minister for Public Health in 2011 when we committed to bringing forward legislation to ensure our system of health and social care focuses on the people who need it most. I also have personal experience of working in health and social care before being elected. Uh, I was a home care organiser, so this subject is of particular importance to me. For people who have multiple complex needs, young or old, health and social care support that is well joined up can be the key to living full lives, going to work, living in their own homes and participating in the lives of their communities. People are living longer in Scotland, testament to, in large part to great improvements in our health and care services over many years, and that is a, a good thing. As people live longer, integration is about adding quality of life to people's years of life, particularly people with long-term conditions. We know that numbers are going up. In 2013, more than 425,000 people over the age of 75 were living with a long-term condition. By 2037, we expect the number to rise by 83% to 779,000 people. And integration is also about ensuring that we bring compassion, dignity to people and their families at the end of life. So it's important that we plan ahead, ensuring our systems are in good shape to make Scotland an excellent place to live, whatever your age, whatever your circumstances and whatever your support needs. These are objectives that I know we all share for ourselves and for our loved ones, and I'm grateful to this Parliament for its support across the floor for this programme of reform over the last few years. I'm also grateful to colleagues in COSLA, whose leadership on this agenda I greatly value. This is a, a hugely ambitious national programme of reform. At its heart, though, uh, are, of course, people. I was reminded of this when I recently visited Clipmanager Community Healthcare Centre, which provides a wide range of services to its local community. The centre is home to two inpatient wards, three GP, GP practices, a day therapy unit, and a local mental health resource centre. This is what integration is about, bringing together services and professionals to ensure an integrated person-centred experience. Nationally, we are now moving into implementation in a couple of weeks' time. The first of our new integrated partnerships for health and social care will go live. In one sense, years of hard work by colleagues in the NHS, local government, the third and independent sectors, government and parliament is coming to fruition. In another sense, though, this is just one more, albeit large, stride along the path. That's why I'm hosting a, a conference for leaders on integration later this month, to which I've invited some of uh, the parliamentarians uh, here today, and I hope that you can uh, attend. The idea of integrating is not new. Community health partnerships set the baseline for today's reforms. Under reshaping care for older people, we, reintroduced, we introduced sorry, the change fund with the principle of pooling a proportion of the money we commit to health and social care. Now we're building on that by bringing together budgets, planning and provision along the whole pathway of care, primary health care, social care and aspects of hospital care that provide the best opportunities for redesign in favour of prevention. Progress is local too. All around Scotland, chief officers are being appointed to lead the work of the new partnerships and consultation is underway on their integration schemes. Their partnership agreements, which must be submitted for approval by the 1st of April. A lot of work goes into writing the integration schemes in each area. Each one is unique to the circumstances of the partnership. Each one depends on strong joint working between the Health Board and Council. And it's great to see these core documents arriving now for sign-off. Just a few weeks ago, it gave me tremendous pleasure to approve the integration schemes for the three Ayrshire partnerships and lay the order in Parliament that will enable them to be established in April. 
Of course, once the integration schemes are signed off, the local work to improve outcomes really begins as partnerships get to work on their strategic plans for integrated services. Already from around the country, we can see examples of local commitment to improvement through integration, such as Glasgow's ambitious programme to reduce delayed discharge and improve intermediate care. It's not just Glasgow, across the country, partnerships are starting to behave as if they were already integrated. Local information tells us that delayed discharges are starting to come down. Two thirds of partnerships look well placed to deliver the two week target at April. That kind of innovation will be crucial to success in terms of improving outcomes and what happens in communities within partnerships in primary and social care settings will be as important as what happens in hospitals. And that's why we've legislated for localities within partnerships. Through localities, communities, clinicians and other professionals will directly influence how services are provided and resources are used. Localities' priorities must drive strategic planning and partnerships to enable a real shift towards supporting people in their own homes. Of course, improving care is not a task only for the statutory partners, the third and independent sectors and the views of users and carers are important too. Our legislative framework assures their role in strategic planning and localities. As part of ensuring real improvement in the quality of services, we're also integrating and enhancing improvement support, bringing together Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Joint Improvement Team and the Quality and Efficiency Support Team and providing an additional two and a half million to support improvement in the new integrated health and social care landscape. I previously committed to refreshing our 2020 vision for health and social care. We'll sharpen its focus even further on integration's foundation, the triple aim for raising performance, improve people's experience of care, improve the well-being of the population and improve the use of resources. Integration will bring together the very significant resources we commit to health and social care. We've provided some flexibility for local systems to agree the integrated arrangements most appropriate to local circumstances. The legislation sets out the minimum that must be integrated, amounting to at least £7.7 .7 billion of health and social care resource integrated across the country to maximise people's outcomes. Nevertheless, we recognise that some additional resource to support innovation is important. We're already providing £100 million in 2015-16 to support innovation and integrated practice in partnerships under the Integrated Care Fund. Earlier today, I announced extension of the Integrated Care Fund for a further two years. £100 million per year will be provided in 2016-17 and 2017-18. The £200 million is part of more than half a billion pounds of additional funding that we will be providing over the next three years to support integration. Yes. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary for, for giving way. She um, mentioned uh, just a moment ago in her opening remarks um, outcomes, and I think we would agree that these are particularly important. What, what is the government's definition of outcomes with health and social care integration, and how will these be measured? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, the, the outcomes have been uh, published today and uh, will be available to members. I'm just about to come on to say something about that. But they will be measured through the information that is gathered and the data that is gathered through local partnerships. We are providing a lot of support to make sure each partnership has a baseline. So each will have a baseline of information that they can then measure progress against so that they can show, not them, just themselves, but the wider population they serve and us, that the progress they're making across those outcomes. So I'll come on to say a little bit more about that in a minute. This investment will support and drive innovation in local systems. The money will be used to build up pre preventative and anticipatory care, to drive down delayed discharge, to extend our use of telehealth and to support primary care in its key role in leading integration. How will we know whether integration is working, which is uh, the, the, the question that essentially has just been asked. Well, today um, I have published indica indicators, which you can find in SPICE, that have been developed in partnership with the NHS, COSLA and the third and independent sectors. The new partnerships will publish annual performance reports using these indicators, which replace the previous indicators for reshaping care for older people by drawing together measures that are appropriate for the whole system under 
uh, integration. They reflect two important aspects of care. Firstly, people's experience of care, such as a percentage of adults who are able to look after their own health well. And secondly, key measures of effectiveness of the system, such as the rate of emergency admissions to hospital for adults and the percentage of people who are discharged from hospital within 72 hours of being ready. These indicators will help us to understand progress across Scotland towards our core priorities. The other ones will not be of a surprise uh, to people. They are exactly what we would expect uh, to, to measure in terms of making progress. We're also investing in improving the data available to partnerships, robust data which can be aggregated at different levels of granularity for localities and partnerships will be vital. Partnerships must use the data available to them to ensure they focus their efforts on the people for whom they, there are the greatest opportunities for improvement. The new partnerships will manage the resources currently associated with 96% of delayed discharges and 83% of unplanned admissions for people aged over 75. For example, from our ongoing work to improve the standard of the data we collect, we also now understand that nationally 2% of the population accounts for 50% of hospital and prescribing resource use. That is a huge opportunity for uh, the partnerships to get um, and identify their 2% of the population and importantly to do something about better supporting them. We don't know yet uh, whether um, the, the distribution is uh, appropriate. We are gathering the community data necessary to understand the full picture and we will be helping partnerships with that. Locally, this kind of analysis will enable people through strategic planning to look closely at whether people are getting the right kinds of care to maximise their well-being. By putting a human face on data, the new partnerships will be well placed to focus on priorities for improvement on the people who need and use care most to improve their well-being and on improving the sustainability of services. In future, that may mean providing more care in communities and less within the hospital environment when that is not in the best interest of the person receiving care. We do still have some way to go, to go though on shifting that balance. Tackling delayed discharges and managing unscheduled care remain among my highest priorities. We allocated significant additional funding at the end of last year to reduce delayed discharge. The impact of our overall investments in delayed discharge will take some time to be felt, but I was pleased that the January census showed that 20 local authorities had delays over two weeks in single figures and are well placed to deliver the zero target at April against that two week target. Our focus over winter was on easing pressure on the acute sector, so it was pleasing to see the most recent, recent statistics indicating some improvement in delayed discharge uh, across that period. We're not complacent though, and we still have much to do. One patient delayed is one too many. I want to eradicate this problem. For those people who are delayed, we're providing the worst possible outcome at the highest possible cost. Clinical evidence shows us that any delay over 72 hours is detrimental to well-being. At the January census, 14 local authority areas recorded fewer than 10 delays of, of more than 72 hours, showing it can be done. You'll see that our indicators for integration include performance against a 72-hour discharge measure, which have been agreed and welcomed by COSLA. Two priorities are key to implementation of integration. The first of which I've spoken about at length is improving outcomes for people using services. The second, without which the first cannot succeed, is to support the workforce into and through implementation. The quality of health and social care in Scotland depends on its compassionate and motivated workforce, ensuring that the workforce is organised appropriately to provide the right care in the right place at the right time will be central to success. People who work in multidisciplinary, multi-agency teams tell us that it's better for them and better for the people they care for. Integrated working means that people are not working in silos. It avoids a situation where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And most importantly, it's satisfying to know that you're working in a team where the person being cared for is supported to achieve the outcomes that matter most to them. Our ambitions for health and social care integration are clearly set out. Wherever you live and whatever your circumstances, we're committed to ensuring this country is the best place to live healthy, fulfilling 
and independent lives. I'm very happy to accept the amendments, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think they, uh, in the spirit of consensus, uh, add to our motion, and uh, I move the motion in my name. Excellent. Many thanks. I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to you and move Amendment 12710.3. Ten minutes or thereby, please, Ms Marrett. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for this opportunity this afternoon to debate uh, integration of health and social care services. And she and I both agree, I know, that this is uh, one of the biggest challenges in our health service at the moment, but that it is uh, a complex challenge, and especially um, on a local level, a complex and difficult challenge to, um, to get these things right. Presiding officer, the integration of health and social care is a reform that Scottish Labour has advocated for a long time now, and is firmly a shared ambition of um, this parliament. And against a backdrop of an increasingly ageing population and straightened budgets, getting an efficient and smooth patient flow through our health system is absolutely essential if we are to end the shortfalls in care, which I think we have to be honest, which are um, in our communities today. And it should form part of a shift to a more preventative focus to delivering health care which deals with smaller problems and identifies problems before they manifest themselves or become too big to manage in the home or in the community and then end up in our hospitals in the acute system as bigger, um, more expensive problems, both for public budgets, but also for the impact on people's lives and their families to deal with. Now, presiding officer, we recognise the hard work that is going into making this happen, the hard work by our local authorities and our health boards across the country, and the willingness of people to create meaningful and effective working partnerships for the good of patients. And we also acknowledge the difficulty in managing such a change and welcome the progress that has been made by the Scottish Government and the local authorities across this country. The establishment of the Joint Integration Boards is a critical step, I think, in making reality a reform which will hopefully allow us to protect and care for predominantly for elderly people, but for people right across our communities and those who are vulnerable in their homes in a way that we would want to care for our own loved ones. I'm struck, presiding officer, by the many representations I've had from stakeholders on these issues because we know uh, that they are complex and difficult challenges there. There are procedural issues which have been raised with me, such as ensuring our various local partners are consulted, and nervous, nervousness sorry, around budgets, as these two sides, as we speak here today, are coming together and thrashing out budgets, how much the, healths, um, the health boards put into this, how much local authorities put into this. And I've had many representations from councillors as well as to how local authorities um, will meet the, uh, the budget constraints that they are expected to come up with. But there is broad agreement on the principle of bringing together these two essential services and ensuring a joined up and consistent approach. With such goodwill going forward towards a difficult project, I'm confident that everyone involved is doing their very best to make this a success. And I'm sure we all agree that though ensuring a more functional way of delivering health and social care is an important step, it can only be a starting point. Presiding officer, I'd like to quote from the briefing that the, the BMA have given us today, which says that structural reform is not an end in itself, and it is vital that these proposed new models for health and social care focus more on outcomes than the management structure. And that's why I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's publication today of the, the core suite of indicators that give us a starting point as to what those outcomes look like so we can measure progress against that. The British Medical Association presiding officer also cites investment in building capacity in community and social care services as one of the key issues that need to be addressed. And I think that is the essential point. When you have one budget struggling to deliver a service and another budget 
under constraints too. Pulling them together does not automatically deliver the results we would want. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary has had representations on this, as I have had. Unless we properly resource our hard-working NHS staff and care workers with what they need, we will continue to see a logjam in the system and patient care will continue to be impacted. The Board's integration on the 1st of April, as I said, is only a starting point to this. But I think a bigger step in the right direction would be a proper resourcing of care workers so we can move to a point where um, all care workers across the country are earning the living wage and there, there are more of them to deliver mm -hmm. the care that we need. We also know, and Labour has argued this point in the Chamber before, that we do need uh, more nurses in mm -hmm. our NHS to actually deliver the care that is required, both in hospitals, in the acute setting and in the community. Presiding officer, I think it would be remiss of me not to, or of this, this debate this afternoon, not to um, rehearse some of the challenges that people in our communities are facing, because this is a quite um, technical and, and complex matter that we're putting together, these joint integration boards. But the human face of this is never far, I think, from all of our surgeries as MSPs, but certainly in our communities. And it's important to remember why these changes are necessary and why it is very, very important that we get this right. Presiding officer, 15-minute care visits, leaving our elderly with insufficient care and more likely to end up in hospital as a result and that, that care um, that they are not getting. Unacceptable levels of delayed discharge. And I um, take the Cabinet Secretary's point that she is making some progress, but I'm sure she would agree with me um, as we had this debate um, in the, the, the public forum a couple of weeks ago that the delayed discharge figures are still unacceptable, meaning that people are kept in hospital beds at, the, at an expense to their own health, but at a massive public cost. Yes. Sandra White. I thank the, mention, uh, the member for taking intervention. Would the member agree with me that in some cases local authorities are simply not working with health boards and vice versa? And this causes delayed discharge. Jenny Mara. Well, I, I, I think that Sandra White you know, says the whole point of this debate today is that local authorities and health boards are coming together to try and integrate this care to, to prevent delayed discharge. I, I'm trying to go through the, um, the, the impact in our communities, but I think that that, that is indeed the, the whole point of this. When she says some local authorities aren't working, perhaps she um, touches on, on quite a good point that I think from what I have heard, that some of the integration models across the country and the people I've been speaking to, that it seems to be working more smoothly and the boards are coming together in a more holistic way in some parts of the country um, and perhaps um, not so in others. And I did want to ask the Cabinet Secretary, perhaps she can address this when she's summing up later on, if there are going to be standards across the country so we are making sure that there are standards um, that are set by the Scottish Government so we don't have a kind of postcode lottery, if, um, um, for want of a better phrase, where standards of integration are working better in some parts of the country than there are in others. But to go back to uh, the human impact of this, we do know that delayed discharge means that people are in hospital at a cost to themselves and their own health, but also at a great cost to, to, to the public um, purse uh, when they should be at home. We know that half a million bed days have been lost and more than 400 patients have sadly lost their lives while waiting uh, to be discharged after having been medically and clinically fit to go home. We also know that the failure to meet accident and emergency targets across Scotland time and again and especially this winter are having an impact at the other end of the hospital at the back door of the hospital and this is an integrated problem. We know every time we fail to get this care right that it is a sick or a vulnerable or an elderly person put through a distress which should not happen in our modern health service. Despite the clear challenges we face with our ageing population and both budgets of health boards and local authorities under serious pressure, 
We can, must do better, and we must get this right. So we welcome the progress that has been outlined today, um, but we should also recognise that we are still a long way from realising our ambitions. And I would reiterate again that I think that integration on the 1st of April is really the first step to getting this right. It is our intention, presiding officer, to support the government's uh, motion this afternoon, and I thank um, the Cabinet Secretary for um, supporting um, our amendment today as well. Um, in the spirit of that, I would be very interested if the government could set out um, perhaps their, their plan of how exactly um, delayed discharge, she, she said she would pledge that it would be ended uh, by the end of this year. Is that the end of, of this calendar year? And therefore, is there um, a plan on top of the, the integrated boards as to how she will manage to do that? Presiding officer, I share her determination and I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary meeting her pled pledge on delayed discharge. Presiding officer, I think today is a good opportunity to debate this important issue um, and I look forward to hearing the contributions. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I now call on Annette Milne to speak to and move Amendment 12710.2. Fairly generous six minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary said, this debate is timely, given that all health boards are required by law to submit their integration schemes for ministerial approval by the 1st of April, and the new health and social care partnerships across Scotland must be up and running by the same date next year. Even before the legislative route was considered, there were a number of areas of good practice where progress was being made towards the integration of health and social care. Notably, from my point of view, the excellent collaborative work in West Lothian and in Highland, which I saw at first hand as a member of the Health and Sport Committee. Unfortunately, such good practice wasn't uniform across the country, hence the need for legislation. And I'm pleased to hear that the first integration joint board for Ayrshire has been approved this month and look forward to the coming, forthcoming establishment of health and care social care partnerships throughout Scotland. From the unprecedented number of briefings we've received ahead of this debate, it's clear that there is complete agreement across all sectors that integration is vital if the 2020 vision for health and social care, which has cross-party support in this parliament, is to be achieved, and that this will require the ongoing commitment of NHSS boards and local authorities to work together in pursuit of the outcomes which Scotland's patients and service users need and want with services at local level designed with and for the recipients of these services. Without integration, it's hard to imagine how the complex needs of an ageing and increasingly frail elderly population can be met, and the aspiration achieved of people living good lives uh, as healthy as possible in their local communities for as long as possible, reducing the need for unplanned hospital admissions, and hence relieving the pressures on our emergency services and helping patients flow through secondary care when that's needed, so that delayed discharge ceases to be the serious issue that it is currently. But it's clear, as others have said, there is still a considerable way to go to achieve the necessary integration between all the health and social care services which are required to cater for the increasing demands of demographic change. And a number of organisations have expressed their current concerns to us this week. The BMA stresses that health boards and local authorities must engage meaningfully with clinicians from both primary and secondary care at both strategic and locality level. And there's a clear message that GPs must have a leadership role locally with the authority and influence to deliver effective integration. GPs, are, are, in my opinion, are pivotal in directing care for their patients. And their activities account for around 50% of total spending on the NHS in Scotland. So clearly their role in the planning of integrated services is crucial. I was, I confess, a little bit dismayed at the Health Committee meeting this week when we were discussing seven-day working, that although around the table integration cropped up on several occasions, GPs were scarcely mentioned until I reminded witnesses of their key role, which of course they did agree with. The College of GPs, RCGP, would like to see general practice recognised as the major hub in a network of community health provision, working, of course, with a team of health professionals, including health visitors, district nurses, advanced nurse practitioners, associated health professionals, and social care and third sector providers, all of whom are key to the well-being of an ageing and increasingly dependent population. 
Historically, these various professionals did work in silos, parallel to rather than with each other, and it requires a significant change in culture and trust for these people to set aside the professional differences and come together as a team focused on the holistic needs of every person within their care. The GP is the obvious person to lead such a team and to be fully engaged in planning local services. Having seen at first hand the success of the former local healthcare cooperatives, I read with interest the BMA's proposal for, a GP, for GP cluster groups within a geographical locality working together and advising the Health and Social Partnership on the provision and performance of services locally, which they suggest would give local control over service delivery, allowing early resolution of problems and the development of best practice for patients and service users and engaging the GPs within the locality. And of course, we lost that engagement with the much larger um, and um, CHPs, which had, had less responsibility as well. Uh, well, indeed. To Richard Simpson. I, I, wasn't a, I wasn't aware of that, but I'm glad to hear it because I think it is, it is a, a fundamental point. The, the third sector also has a key role in the successful integration of health and social care and could make a very valuable contribution to service planning. Many good projects were developed using the Change Fund for Reshaping Care for Older People, such as the befriending service set up by Voluntary Action Orkney and a transport um, collaborative in project in my own home region, working to improve and coordinate health and social care transport and remove a barrier for older people to get to medical appointments or to allow them to get to local activities aimed at reducing social isolation. There's concern within this sector that a loss of change funding could jeopardise the provision of excellent preventative measures such as these, which have been shown to improve the well-being of many people and have cut down on the number of GP and nursing consultations. Marie Curie has stressed that health and social care services are crucial, and I agree, to ensuring appropriate care for people with terminal illness, whatever its cause, and they're concerned that at the present time there is a lack of progress by some integration authorities in coming together, and they're worried that if the transition towards integrated care is not carried out smoothly, there could be an ad adverse impact on third sector services which involve partnership with statutory bodies and which need decisions and funding to be agreed for service level agreements. The RCN point out some issues which they feel need to be addressed in the year, which remains before the deadline for integration, if we're to be confident that integration plans will indeed improve care for the people they represent, such as the need for quality and safety to be written into commissions for providing services, whoever is delivering them. And to ensure the robust governance of care, they've developed a checklist of issues which they think local integration schemes should address. And of course, they also point out the need for integrated IT systems across health and social care. Nearly all the issues raised in the, the briefings we've had indicate a need for investment. And some concern was expressed, you particularly by the BME, please. that the previously announced 100 million may not, not have been sufficient to build up the community and social care capacity needed to achieve genuinely integrated care. So I've no doubt they will be encouraged by today's announcement of the further 200 million over the next two years. So to conclude, presiding officer, there's widespread support for the integration of health and social care, but as our amendment suggests, there are still enormous challenges to be overcome in order to achieve it. So I move the amendment in my name, and we will also support the other amendments at decision time. Thanks very much. I now call on Jim Hume to speak to and move Amendment 12710.1 and a similarly generous amount of time is available to you, Mr Hume. Uh, th thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I'll start by welcoming, welcoming uh, today's announcement of £200 million into the Integration Fund and the mention, of course, telehealth and, and mental health uh, services capacity. Uh, this debate is timely. We are approaching the deadline for local authorities to produce their integration schemes. And that said, like others, I note that Ayrshire have already had their scheme approved by the Cabinet Secretary. Clearly, the success of good integration will lie with detail from the very beginning. But there are challenges that we must address early on to achieve the aims of the Act, and the Scottish Government, I'm sure, won't be uh, complacent at this stage. The health and social care integration comes at a moment when there's the chance to prevent a crisis from materialising. I want to bring to the debate, uh, like others, the views of the British Medical Association. First, 
ensuring sufficient capacity building in community and social care services must be accompanied by recurring and sustainable action for long-term planning. Secondly, engagement must be among both primary and secondary care clinicians on the relevant integration joint boards and monitoring committees to allow for, of course, a coordinated and effective integration. And thirdly, allow medical leadership at the level, a local level where GPs are actively and strategically involved in the planning of this integration. I think these three points are the key to ensure that patients and communities receive the necessary and appropriate capacity and support. We know that this change will not happen overnight. Transition must occur in a highly facilitated manner while addressing the main drivers for health and social care integration. We know that bed blocking is still a real threat to the maintenance of a high quality health care provision in hospitals. I welcome uh, any progress we are having, but the Royal College of Emergency Medicine warns that lack of hospital beds after emergency admissions is one of the main causes for higher patient mortality. Simply putting crowding does kill. We have heard this call from uh, other experts. Patients are not being released from hospitals on time, causing bottle, bottlenecks in the, in the system, reducing the ca capacity of caring for new patients. The numbers show that almost three quarters of total delayed discharge bed days are occupied by patients aged 75 and over. And that number is estimated to double in the next 10 years. Uh, we regret that the government actually uh, cut a third of geriatric beds since 2010 before integration was in place, as that's put uh, additional pressure on the system. And we know the choking uh, figure of almost 170,000 bed days lost uh, as a result. An ageing population is a ticking time bomb and less addressed. More people are having to live with multiple complex and long-term conditions. So getting the right treatment at the right time in the right place for those we need it is critical if we are to continue on track to make Scotland a leader in health care service provision. I think we need to also think about palliative care and how we can improve access to that. We know from an earlier Marie Curie, Edinburgh University and NHS Lothian research that only 20% of non-cancer patients in Scotland are receiving palliative care before passing away. Most patients in the study were uh, identified for palliative care too late to fully benefit, on average only eight weeks before dying. The resources put in place uh, for integration should include those who are at the end of their life, who need support, empowerment and information to soften the transitions in their mental and physical health. That is also echoed by the British Heart Foundation. Uh, the British Heart Foundation is running a pilot programme of cardiac psychologists in NHS North Ayrshire and Arran, where support is given to patients of heart disease after major incidents. Within two years of such in incidents, 50 per cent of patients develop depression and less appropriate and personal care is given. But this is beyond the capacity of clinicians at hospitals. People should be assured of support when they return home after long hospital stays. And the only way to achieve that is uh, through ensuring a successful integration from the very outset. That's why I want to point out the importance of the last two points of the BMA. Involving GPs who have an integral role to play through their expertise in public health must be highly encouraged and facilitated. The Royal College of General Practitioners is calling for GPs to have the network literacy to ensure patients receive the care they deserve. However, I do remain concerned, and the Cabinet Secretary will not be surprised that I raise this, that funding for our general medical services has been cut to a, a record low. I realise the Cabinet Secretary will be at pains to talk about the £40 million of un, uh, additional funding, but uh, I'm told there's a lack of clarity from those in the profession about where exactly this money is going, indeed where it's been deployed and if it's actually been allocated yet. So perhaps the Cabinet Secretary may mention this in her summing up. Presenting officer, uh, integrating health and social care is a no small task, but for the welfare of patients and for the dedicated health and social work staff who will be empowered to provide better care for their communities, integration is of course very welcome. It's a long-standing standing ambition of man, uh, politicians and health professionals alike. The challenges must be acknowledged by this government for it to be successful, and we need the government to give the professionals the support they need to allow them to give their patients the best of care. 
With nearly 170,000 beddies lost to boarding, this ticking time bomb can't be allowed to continue. And I look to the Cabinet Secretary for assurances that she will support the Liberal Democrat amendment, which reflects the views of health professionals across Scotland. We shall be supporting all amendments and the Government's uh, motion today, and I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And we now move to the open debate. Uh, we have a bit of time in hand today. Um, so I can be generous with time, and I firstly call on Bob Doris to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Um, it's a uh, presiding officer, rather, sorry. Um, this morning, I, I spent my morning uh, meeting a, a gentleman called Tommy Taylor, 100 years old today, uh, stays uh, up in uh, Parkhouse in, in North Glasgow. Uh, wonderful man, still very sprightly stays independent living, stays in sheltered housing, but he has his own house. It was a privilege to meet him um, and pass on my kind regards to him. Um, he wasn't part of a ticking time bomb. He was part of the celebration, which is people getting to live into old age, to be happy and healthy and content. Um, I'm not deliberately having a, a go at Mr Hume. It's just it doesn't sit easy with me, that expression, ticking time bomb. If we have a, an issue and a problem with people growing older, We've got an issue with our value set. We should relish people growing older and valued society. I know that's not the expression Mr Hume was meaning. Yes, of course. Jim Hume. I apologise. Yeah. The, 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 the part of his suggestion, of course, is that it is forecast that we'll be, we will have more people that are over 75. The majority of uh, beds being uh, blocked are from people of, of elder age. So, therefore, there is a problem that we are going to get more and more pressure on, on beds. That's the... Bob I, I, I promise, Mr. I wasn't, I, I wasn't trying to be unhelpful. I was just trying to make a general point about healthy, active ageing, and we want more of it. Um, that's all I was trying to do. And this debate is an opportunity for the entire Parliament to come together and unite around the clear benefits that should flow from health and, so and, health and social care integration. And with integration beginning in April 2015 and to be fully implemented by April 2016, it is important that local integration partnerships are both supported and resourced. Um, and the Scottish Government has clearly invested and continues to invest much resource. And I'm going to list some of that investment but uh, for a very specific reason. But let me just run through some of that investment just now. For instance, the Integrated Care Fund, which we've heard of, will provide £100 million in 2015-16 for partnerships to improve outcomes and to support service redesign in favour of prevention. And such financial support will be built on from investing from the Reshaping Care for Older People Change Fund, which we've already heard about £300 million over four years ending this year. If you feed in the mix, £73.5 million to pertain centrally for nationally supported initiatives and an additional £100 million specifically on delayed discharge, you get a very self-evident picture of huge investment in this area. I think that the point I want to make is that cash invested does not necessarily make a measure of the quality of service provided to patients. So that is the reason for listing the, the undoubted resource that, that has been put in. It's how the money is spent, how it is invested in a strategic and coordinated way. That's what makes the real difference. It's the lived outcomes of older people. That's what matters. Um, just a couple of things in relation, first of all, to the, the uh, Change Fund for Older People. We now have the, the, this new £100 million fund. I'm minded that Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland has drawn our attention to the fact that a lot of what they would see as successful pilots from the reshaping care for older people monies hasn't been mainstreamed. And the real challenge for the new integration fund over this year and the coming two years, delighted that extra £200 million investment, is that some of that is mainstreamed and it's not recurring pilots. I think that's a real challenge that we have. And I just wanted to put some of that on the record as well. At, at Health Committee on Tuesday, my, my, my Labour colleague, Dr Richard Simpson, spoke of consulted vacancies. Uh, in the NHS and concerns over nurse nursing numbers that have been trained. In my comments, I, I noted uh, 1,200 additional consultants existed in the system and I noted 2,300 additional nurses under this, this current government. I was trying to put into context the comments that, that Dr Simpson was making, but I should also point out that I stressed it was about having the right professional with the right skills at the right place at the right time to help out. And that won't always be a consultant. And it won't always be a nurse. And I just get a feeling that on all sides of the chamber, including this side, we sometimes bean count the head count on things that get the headlines, be it consultants or be it nurses. But 
I think some of the, the evidence we're getting through the Health Committee is about a well-resourced, well-planned, multidisciplinary team. Maybe it's not always a thousand more nurses you need. Maybe it's five or six more nurses in a certain place with a physiotherapist and another OT and a social worker available at weekends. Maybe it's that kind of thing. And when we take forward our integrated workforce planning, perhaps we have to be less simplistic. Yes, we need national workforce plans, workforce recruitment plans and training plans for nurses and for consultants. But at the very localised area, I think we have to get better fleshed out workforce planning. And it's not that um, impressive for politicians to talk about can we just have four more nurses and one physiotherapist? It makes sense to say, give us a thousand of this and five hundred of that, and we grab the headlines. But it's about real quality local planning and multidisciplinary teams. And surely, to goodness, that's what health and social care integration is about. So I just wanted to put that on record uh, here this afternoon. Um, so many different things I wanted to see. I should mention Glasgow, of course, and an equal measure. Can I give uh, Glasgow City Council uh, criticism and praise? Uh, Hopefully that still keeps the consensus on board today. Um, I, I think there has been a bit of active gatekeeping for vulnerable elderly people in Glasgow seeking to get residential home placements. I've got constituency cases that I believe would flesh that out and I've got significant concern over it. But in the same breath, I have to say to you that David Williams, the head of social work in Glasgow, is also the head of the Shadow Integration Board. And he, along with the Health Board, have fast-tracked 120 new intermediate beds, hopefully to tackle that very problem that I'm saying. So criticism and praise in equal measure. Maybe we're starting to see some of the fruits of health and social care integration happening, because actually it's about cultural shifts rather than structural change. And that's a theme that I think all the briefing papers we got here today wanted to say. Uh, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about carers because part of that health and social care multidisciplinary team does, does for me mean care staff in a residential home somewhere. Uh, we do maybe have to get a bit more clever at churning out, uh, 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 identifying where there's care worker churn because you need Drive stable, course, committed care home staff to provide a quality service in the care home. We need better at-home care to have people living happier and healthier at home in the first place before they go to a care home. That's all part of active, positive local planning in the local area. I suppose my appeal in finishing off is less of the headline grabbing claims about a thousand more of this or two thousand more of that and good quality local planning that doesn't grab the headlines but delivers for our constituents. Yeah, yeah. Many thanks. Now, Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Sandra White. Up to seven minutes. That presiding officer, as Jenny Mara reminded us, quoting the BMA structure, structural reform is not an end in itself. And while much of the guidance and regulations over the last few uh, months has been about structures, the truth of the matter is that structures are a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition uh, for successful integration. During the course of the bill, various experts kept emphasising that the key issues were culture change, leadership bringing teams together on the ground and uh, locality arrangements which are meant to be the engine room of integration. And I suppose my first concern is that there doesn't yet seem to be any clarity about those locality arrangements. I tried to introduce an amendment at stage three uh, to put something about locality arrangements on the face of the bill and Alec Neil, the Cabinet Secretary at the time, said it wasn't necessary because there was going to be statutory guidance. But the statutory guidance hasn't uh, yet uh, turned up. And I think there's a general issue that some of the guidance in general is being uh, a bit delayed. I know the City of Edinburgh uh, Council I spoke to uh, told me that they'd, uh, they'd finalised their scheme with NHS Lothian at the beginning of the no November and then suddenly a guide to reviewing an integrated scheme appeared on the 14th of the member and they had to make major changes to their scheme. But anyway, that's water under the bridge now and they have finalised their scheme. But in terms of locality arrangements, I think the Scottish Government needs to establish clear frameworks and responsibilities. We need to know what can localities decide, what is their role in delivering outcomes, who is going to be involved uh, and will budgets be devolved to them. It's very important in particular that all health professionals are part of that process. We don't want the problems that we had with CHPs where GPs weren't enough involved, but equally we don't want the problems we had with LHCCs before them where other health professionals apart from GPs weren't sufficiently involved. So clearly nurses and all health professionals need to be uh, involved. Now clearly a lot of the hopes for integration are around dealing with uh, problems about uh, 
unplanned admissions, so it is welcome that the specialities uh, commonly associated with the, the emergency care pathway are all going to be the responsibility uh, of the integrated joint board. I will talk about that because all uh, areas apart from Highland are following that model. So uh, clearly, avoiding unnecessary emergency admissions is the kind of holy grail of health policy for over a decade. Uh, and the associated problem will, of eliminating delayed discharge. So it's very welcome that the Cabinet Secretary has uh, said that the indicators for those two issues will be absolutely central in terms of evaluating the success of integration. Jenny Mara rightly said that investment in social care services uh, um, you know, has to be absolutely crucial to this. And I certainly know from a recent constituency example what problems there are in social care. We all know about the 15-minute visits, but the example that I've had recently over a period of weeks is a man who, I think he's in his, he's, he's in his 90s, and he's, he needs to have two people visit him four times a day, and it's just not happening on a regular basis. Sometimes there are missed visits, sometimes one person comes instead of two, which is no good since he requires to be lifted. Uh, it's a private provider who say they can't deliver this because staff are leaving and they can't get staff. The council can't take it over. So to me, it's kind of encapsulated the problems uh, of uh, social care currently. Now, I think um, while welcoming the fact that we've got the specialities commonly associated with the emergency care pathway in the integrated joint board, there is, of course, a potential, a potential uh, downside of that, and that's been highlighted uh, to us by the Neurological Alliance who are out in the members' lobby uh, all of this week. And, and their point is uh, that, um, that, um, um, that, that neurolo neurological care uh, is, um, is going to be part of the non-integrated services because there aren't a, a massive number of emergency admissions and it's the, it's the number of emergency admissions that, uh, that dictates whether the speciality is going to be in the integrated board. So neurology won't be there and they're worried that uh, those who are left, as it were, with the non-integrated services uh, will see little change in their care and they point out that specialist nurses that we all know about for neurological conditions and other health, NHS professionals must, be, must have good links to colleagues in the community. And when I talked to uh, one man, I remember particularly at the Neurological Alliance last night about the problems that he had getting care at home and care workers weren't relating to the health service and care workers wouldn't touch, weren't allowed to touch his medicines. And it just encapsulating that hard divide between local authorities and health service, which we're trying to get uh, beyond. And I'm just noting the concerns of neurological organisations because they are not going to be formally part of the integrated process. But I think, again, talking to some of these organisations last night in the Neurological Alliance reminded uh, me, I, I'm sure we, we don't really need reminding, of the absolute crucial role of the third sector um, in terms of um, services in the community. I think it was Jim Meady that hosted a reception for the A Stitch in Time report uh, a few weeks ago, um, which um, it w was really about um, um, pe older people with degenerative neurological conditions in Lothian and how the work uh, of the various uh, um, uh, third sector neurological organisations not just prevented avoidable hospital admissions, but also optimised their independence and well-being. So it really leads to the general point that we must have the third sector centrally involved in um, the new integration uh, arrangements, both in terms of providing services, coordinating care and contributing to strategic planning. And of course, the other people, it's unfortunate this is coming at the end because they're more important than anybody else, uh, the people who use uh, support and services must be full partners also in the design, delivery uh, and improvement of health and social care. So clearly, bringing together five health board uh, executives and five councillors is a good start for integration, but it is uh, only uh, a start if uh, integration is to realise its full potential. Many, many thanks. And I now call on Sandra White to be followed by John Pentland, a generous six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I welcome this debate? And as the Cab Secretary has already mentioned, uh, the progress made towards integration of health and social care. And I do look forward to the implementation of the new integration joint boards. Uh, but I would like to stress that health and social care integration must be patient-centred. 
and uh, patients, in particular older people, must be part of the design and treatment. Uh, I think Malcolm Chisholm already mentioned that about design and treatment. I believe it uh, should start from the bottom up and uh, patients, as I said, in particular older people, as I am the convener of the cross-party group in age and ageing, and I must say to, to Jim Hume, uh, we look upon uh, older people and getting older as something to celebrate. And I think when you see how active lots of older people are today, they can put a lot of younger people to shame. So I'd just like to make that point to uh, presiding officer. Uh, I think that uh, we need to look at that to make sure they are at the beginning part of the design and treatment uh, to ensure that this legislation does indeed benefit all who, who needs it. Uh, I note the amendment in Nanette Mill's name, uh, which indeed highlights the challenges integration presents, and particularly amongst health boards and local authorities, which has already mentioned. But uh, I Perhaps we'd go a little further. I think Bob Doris mentioned this as well. I suggest that in a number of areas, culture change is probably the best way to go forward in that. And it's certainly you know, required very much so to ensure that uh, all agencies work together in this legislation can actually benefit everyone it's supposed to benefit. And uh, I think Malcolm Chisholm once again has mentioned that, probably took part of what I was going to say. But I do think it's very important. I think it must include the third sector. Uh, they do a fantastic job at the moment uh, within our communities and beyond. And if I could just raise a couple of points which haven't been mentioned, but certainly are within this integration opportunities. And it was outlined in the Public Bodies Bill Policy Memorandum that one of the key outcomes for seeking to integrate health and social care should be about the utilisation of talents, capacity and the potential of all uh, of Scotland's peoples and communities in designing and delivering health and social services. Uh, also, the integration agenda should be about power balance, and I think that's an important issue already been mentioned between health boards and local authorities. Uh, people must have greater control over the policies and services which impact on their lives, and this certainly is acknowledged by the government in its 2020 vision, which, uh, building on uh, Chrissy's recommendations, outlines the need to shift the balance of power to and build on the assets of individuals and communities, support the self-management of long-term conditions and personal action, and support partnership working, which includes a clear role for the third sector in community planning partnerships and new health and social care partnerships. And I think... Yes, I... I wonder Something. if you would agree with me that uh, neighbourhood care schemes, which are uh, more significant in England, uh, and involves significant numbers of volunteers supporting individuals who are vulnerable before or after hospital or indeed at the end of life in their communities is a model which we should be supporting. Andrew White. I, I thank the, the member for that, but I don't think there's any usefulness pitting one agency against another. On Monday, we visited Easter House with the, uh, the committee that we have, Equal Opportunities, and I saw some fantastic agencies, the food train, for instance, which went to older people. So I think uh, perhaps one size wouldn't fit all for everything. But I do you know, take on board what you're saying, but I think we do have agencies here within Scotland who deliver fantastic you know, uh, opportunities uh, for older people and others within their uh, area. But there was another uh, issue I wanted to mention, and obviously the older population has been mentioned on numerous occasions, and as the population increases, I think that we really need to look at uh, the housing providers, yeah. which hasn't been mentioned yet, and uh, be old Hanover Trust Housing Association and others. I think we need to make sure that they're fully utilised within this partnership. Certainly, I'm sure every MSP here has visited these in their constituencies, and they do deliver a fantastic service from people being able to live independently, to people having help, and also having a community hub within their area. And I think it's something that perhaps we've overlooked slightly within the integration. And I think, well, I certainly think that it should be utilised more, because not only do they deliver localised services, uh, they can adapt housing for, for people if they need it, they create community hubs, and obviously they offer various levels of support, whether it be care, specialised care, or independent living. And I think it's something that we should really be looking at to fully, fully involve in health and social care integration, along with obviously the other agencies which we've already mentioned. I think uh, basically people want to live independently, that's what the legislation is indeed for. And if you look at the housing associations along with the other community agencies, 
I think we will be able to give people a choice, and that's really what it should be about also, uh, not fitting people into pegs, but giving them a choice of which way they want to, to live as well. I do appreciate uh, and welcome Jenny Mara's uh, amendment uh, and also the recognition uh, of some local authorities working well, along with health boards and others not. And uh, I do take on board and uh, you know, welcome the suggestion. I think you might have mentioned uh, a benchmark for, you know, for some form of care within the community, but then again, I don't know if it would be possible to make one size fits all. If you've got a large local authority and a large health board, would that work the same as small like Highlands? So I think maybe it would be looked at, but I think it's a really good suggestion and I look forward to the Minister coming back on that particular, particular issue in regards to that. I do uh, look forward and welcome also to the annual reports that the, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned. I think it's really vital that we look at this and if it's working or not. I think it's really important we see the results because without that, then basically we cannot implement uh, this legislation. President Officer, I look forward to the implementation of the legislation to ensure that people can live and be looked after uh, with dignity. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on John Penland to be followed by Kenny McCaskill, up to seven minutes. President Officer, like others, I am looking forward to the better health and social care integration, along with the improved partnership working to achieve that. Of course, certain things will be necessary to ensure that partnerships work as efficiently and as effectively as possible. For example, making sure that the IT systems used by NHS and local authorities are compatible and that the systems put in place do what they're supposed to do. But unfortunately, from what I hear, you know, this is not going to be a straightforward task and perhaps that should not come as a surprise considering that IT projects have a history of being overdue and over budget over and over again. So I sincerely hope lessons have been learned and that, we, and that we do not find ourselves debating the negative side of integration on such matters in a year's time. And obviously the NHS and councils are the big hitters in these new arrangements. They have the budgets and the responsibility to get their systems working smoothly in the new setup. But I want to make sure, and indeed, you know, they need to make sure that this does not exclude or obscure the importance of other players in the partnership, namely the third sector, whose input is crucial to making sure that the system work for the benefit of patients and families that the system is supposed to serve. For I believe that the third sector has a really important role to play as part of the partnership delivering the integration of health and social care services. And I believe there are certain basic principles of partnership working that, that are essential to the, to the success of the new arrangements from the viewpoint of patients, staff and the third sector stakeholders. Now, I recently spoke to the mental health stakeholder group Lanarkshire Lynx about the importance of ensuring their organisation and others can influence decision making and ensuring that they are not forgotten or pushed to one side when it suits those who hold the purse strings or who have a different agenda. And for starters, I think it's very important that the structure and the processes of partnerships recognise the importance of all stakeholders and voluntary se sector organisations and facilitate their participation. Now, in a true partnership, decision-making is an inclusive process and consultation involves more than just decision-makers giving information to those who are affected by their decisions. And consultation should not just be a lip service exercise. It should mean that there is a genuine opportunity for people's responses to be taken on board and a genuine chance to influence outcomes. My second point is that it's important when stakeholders are asked to sign up for plans, all options are on the table. For I believe that should include options that require support or action by others, such as the Scottish Government, other public bodies or a group of professionals. OK, sometimes it's necessary to, to, to do the best we can with available means, but we shouldn't ignore or pretend that other alternatives do not exist, especially when they are preferable and would be feasible if only government or whoever signed up for them. Transparency is pivotal, so 
If a plan has been adopted because a better plan has been blocked, then that should be made clear so that those who have blocked better options are held responsible. Thirdly, when the plans go out to wider public consultation, the public as stakeholders should be made aware and get a right to comment on all possible options too. Consultation documents should not conveniently ignore options, particularly when stakeholders have specifically stated that they think certain options should be included in public consultations. And finally, when a plan is agreed, after stakeholders and the professionals have come together, devoted a lot of time and effort and given careful consideration to the issues before reaching agreement on the best way forward, Big Brother should not ride roughshod over their views. For I know when that happens, particularly if working relationships and careers and funding might be adversely affected, it's very tempting to suffer in silence. So hats off to those who are prepared to put their heads above the parapet and be counted. President officer, in conclusion, the integration of health and social care will no doubt have to deal with early teething problems and obstacles. But I'm sure those people tasked to deliver the changes will do so regardless of these challenges, providing, and as the Cabinet Secretary has already referred to, referred to provided the leader silo helmets at the door. Many thanks. I now call on Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Gil Patterson. Seven minutes or thereby, as well as interventions. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, too, join in the spirit of consensus and agree with a great deal of the points made by uh, John Pentland? I think what I'd like to, first of all, put on record is that this is the right thing to do. Uh, arguably, it's long overdue, and I think that's why we do have such consensus. Equally, I think the reason perhaps that it is long overdue is that it's not without its great difficulties and its great complexities. The driver in many instances, and probably the biggest driver, is the fact that we have an ageing population and the stresses and strains that puts not simply upon our ageing bones, but upon the services that are required to provide for them, whether in the National Health Service or whether at home through uh, local authorities and social uh, care. That is in itself a good thing. I do recall, not in this chamber, I think we were in a previous chamber getting a briefing uh, from Adair Turner, then doing research into uh, the age for the uh, national pension. And I always recall him mentioning that even in the period of simply, I think, over a year, uh, the average life expectancy had increased by a factor considerably more than that. That's a good thing. Uh, the days of perhaps in my parents' generation when you received your gold watch and your sunset was luckily if it was perhaps six months or a year before you departed from this earth uh, was shameful in many ways. People should be able to enjoy uh, their retirement and the benefits that they have accrued over a lifetime. But it does bring challenges, especially for those who have to deal with those who are perhaps more vulnerable, who have difficulties that come with ageing, or indeed simply difficulties that they have acquired through ill health or other misfortune. It does cause bed blocking. It does result in wasted resources. All of us as MSPs know the humiliation that this can bring to an old vulnerable person seeking to go home, the frustration that it can bring and lead to those families desperate to get them out, looking for resources to be able to care for them, a home for them to go to, not to be stuck in a hospital bed. This doesn't come about because of anybody's desire to see that occur. It doesn't come about because people either in local authorities or in the health service don't care. It comes around because of institutional difficulties. And that's why uh, we have to overcome the bureaucracy I think the point made by John Pentland about people in silos and tin hats have to be put beyond us. I think we've all experienced as constituency MSPs perhaps are toing and froing that's not reflected well either on the NHS or indeed sometimes on local authorities in terms of people trying to get out or places trying to be found for them. Thankfully, they are few and far between and the overwhelming majority of instances see people coming together to try and make sure that we end that. But it's not a 
easy. It's not going to be simple. It's very complex because, as John Pentland correctly said, we have multiple agencies. It's not simply personalities, but bureaucracies, but they have to be overcome. And I think all of us of whatever political party, whether we're representing a particular agency of local or national government, the health service or whatever, are obliged to do this because it's the right thing, as I said, to do at the outset, but it's also necessary and won't be easy. What I want to comment on in the final few minutes, Deputy Presiding Officer, is the law of unintended consequences, and I think we need to guard against that. That's not so much uh, for the Cabinet Secretary or indeed for the government agencies. It will, though, be for local authorities, because what I do think we have to guard against is perhaps unintentional consequences, or perhaps and in particular on criminal justice social work. Uh, because we do have to take account of the fact that criminal justice social work is already, uh, perhaps, as sometimes it's perceived mental health as the uh, uh, less important in terms of public perception, uh, in terms of resources and allocation of the spotlight. Certainly criminal justice social work is a smaller section of the wider uh, social work family. And there can be a great difficulty that as health and social care integrate, what is already marginalised within social work could be further jeopardised or endangered. Now, I don't think that would come about through any deliberate attempt by anybody, but because of the pressures that will be brought to bear upon social work, I think there will be pressures that may impact upon criminal justice social work. We do have some um, uh, history of that in Edinburgh. I'm old enough to recall the difficulties we have with Caleb Ness and as a consequence of the tragedy that befell that child, uh, changes took place in Edinburgh. Social work was brought within the education ambit within the city uh, of Edinburgh Council. That, I think, was probably prescient and the right thing to do in a world of challenged resources. We had to limit the number of departments. We had to make sure that we limited the bureaucracy. But there were implications for social work. And as a consequence of the implications for social work, there most certainly were implications for criminal justice social work. And that is but a microcosm of what we're going to see as we go towards integration of health and social care. And therefore, I think it's incumbent upon those dealing with social work and in dealing challenge with the resources allocated to social work to make sure that all the challenges that they face, which are significant, which include the mental health and the issues that we face there, again commented on by John Pentland, the issues we face in terms of child exploitation, historic sexual abuse, all of these issues that cause great public concern and put great pressures upon social workers, if they are if we don't take into account the requirement for the basic job of criminal justice social work, then there is a danger that it may fall off the edge. So, as I say, where I come from that is the requirement, I think, to monitor the law of unintended consequences. This is the right thing to do. It won't simply be in criminal justice social work. There will be other aspects of social work where the clear pressure will be on health and social integration. That is where the driver will be. That is where the spotlight will be. That is where many of the indices that are sought by local and national government will be focused. And we have to make sure that a consequence of that we don't see a debilitation of resources, morale, or whatever else. As I say, this has to come about. I think our people expect no less. Our society requires it. The circumstances in the limited budget means it's necessary. It is the right thing to do. But sometimes when you do the right thing, you can take your eye off the ball. And that's why my plea uh, to the uh, Cabinet Secretary is to ensure that she urges those dealing with the challenges that will be in social work to ensure that they don't forget, not simply uh, their core responsibilities, because there will always have to be that social worker in court for an SER, but to make sure the wider aspects of criminal justice social work. We want to keep it local. We want to keep it at that point of interface, which is why the Cabinet Secretary for Justice will not be going down the road of a single agency. But we do have to ensure protection for the necessity of criminal justice social work and not see it thrown out uh, with the bathwater as we see the integration coming together rightly as it is. Many thanks. And I now call on Gil Patterson to be followed by Paul Martin, a generous seven minutes. Many thanks, uh, President and Officer. <clears throat> I'm pleased to be making a contribution in this debate as a non-member of the Health and Sports Committee. However, at the time of the evidence taking on the Public Bodies Joint Working Act, which covered the integration of health and social care, I was indeed a member of the committee. I 
I listened intently to the evidence that was before us and I came to a conclusion fairly early and, and from the outset and I speak as an individual in this respect and not as a, uh, in behalf of the committee at that time it was clear to me that we were, we were dealing with two massive beasts with vested interests in terms of not only delivery and responsibilities uh, of these services but also the size of their individual budgets. From a personal experience, I know that it's very difficult to spend your budget in areas that you are not uh, directly responsible for, whilst, uh, on the other hand, wanting to do your very best with what you have in order to live up to what is expected of you in terms of your own delivery. So it was almost inevitable that there was reluctance in some quarters to move outside of their direct sphere of influence, which could be said as a natural state of mind. So it's very, very challenging for governments uh, in these circumstances. And I would like to acknowledge that governments in the past put a lot of time and energy into attempting to bring about the integration of health and social care. And they have to be congratulated for having the political will to do so. So when it comes to the present situation uh, that we are that we have uh, now a statutory uh, obligation for the integration to take place, I'm confident that the majority of the members across the chamber I, are committed and supportive of ensuring that this vital process is a success. And although the Scottish Government had to legislate to place a legal obligation on the two big beasts, I don't think it was anything more than a simple cultural shift that was needed, but this didn't materialise. But the legislation will now hopefully encourage this shift to take place in a meaningful way. There are a number of people relying on us to ensure that this integration is a success from the service providers themselves to the service users, and we can't just not fail them. It, would be, uh, it should be acknowledged that we have had some very successful examples of integration taking place without the need for legislation. For instance, in Western Bartonshire, part of which I represent, you can see an exemplary joint working model functioning at a high level, and this occurred without any legislation. The agencies, if I can describe them in, in that way, could see the benefits of integration not only to the public and particularly those in need of crit a critical support, but also to health and local government as well, as, as well. So before people forget, we should put on record their thanks to places like West Lombardia, who overcame the cultural barriers that still ex exist uh, in many parts of Scotland to deliver in the integration of services. And while talking about Western Bartonshire, another benefit from the consensus that exists between the health and social care agencies is also at a political level within the local authority. And although there was a political shift and change of colour of the administration, all the parties were still signed up to what was best for the local people. At present, the Council is planning a very ambitious programme to provide new state-of-the-art care homes in different parts of the Council district. This all by political consensus and a, and a decision that will have a number of positive, uh, positives, including, for example, providing an opportunity to prevent bed blocking, which will have a positive impact on the health service at a national level, and at the same time do a great job for the local people. For integration to be a success, there must be a consensus, and that's exactly what the Western Bartonshire model shows. I see consensus locally in the commitment to delivering an efficient, fair and high level of service to those in need and care and support that's required. 
I also see consensus that I've alluded to at a national level to ensure that the integration is a success through the working together of the Scottish Government, this Parliament, local authorities and the health boards. I hope that the country and the people uh, reap the rewards that I hope flows from what's taking place. We can all take heart and some credit for any success as the work of integration was started by previous administrations and continued and delivered by the present administration. If what we are proposing is a success, when all the services work seamlessly together, the end product is what the general public will be satisfied in and receive the highest level and care of support just when they need it. It sends a strong message to those that we seek to represent the people of Scotland, that when our Parliament works together, it will be they who will benefit most. And I believe that this measure is of the most, uh, is of the utmost importance. And I thank all those from across the chamber and former colleagues in other administrations who have worked for years to deliver this. And I'm sure this time, because it's going to be by statute that things will happen and fair, happen fairly uh, fast. And I commend not only the motion, but the uh, um, amendments to it. Uh, and let's hope for a very successful outcome. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call on Paul Martin to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Uh, officer, it's not that often reported, but there are many occasions in this chamber when all of the various the political parties represented here actually do uh, agree with each other. And I think... Uh, the fact that we do agree with each other and the principles of what's been brought forward here is the very fact that all of our constituents suffer uh, as a result of the fact that integration has not taken place uh, for some time. I think Kenny McCaskill uh, made a valid point when he said that this should have happened uh, before now. So the very fact that it's been interrogated through the, the various levels of uh, scrutiny in the Parliament and we are going to implement this, uh, I think is extremely important. And we've all heard the uh, familiar tales in the constituency caseload uh, that we receive of those constituents who suffer uh, as a result of the paperwork, the bureaucracy, the buck passing that's went on for, for many years uh, and whatever layer of government, regardless of the political uh, parties that are represented in these layers of government, it has been a challenge that's faced us uh, for many years and I hope that we can enforce the principles uh, that have been set out uh, that have been set out in the principles that the Minister set out. And I think that's the challenge for me, though, is that on many occasions we've heard the kind words and the exchanges in this chamber, but ensuring that the actual principles that we set out here today and that there's leadership shown by whatever government is in place is actually extremely important in ensuring that this legislation is effective because we have passed legislation in the past that integrates levels of government but hasn't been enforced as effectively as it should be. In the interest of consensus, though, it's not always the case, and I, I would take issue with the point that uh, Bob Doris raises in, ter in terms of the, uh, the time bomb, the demographic time bomb that I would uh, refer to. I think we have to face up to it. And can I illustrate it in another way that uh, two days ago I turned 40. I was born on the 17th of March, 1967. Uh, I know I don't look it, but uh, I don't expect any other consensual comments in that respect. But... Can I just make the point that in the year uh, 2037, uh, I hope to be at 70. Uh, and can I make the point that by that year, it is, it is projected that there will be 1.4 million uh, pensioners in that year. Now, I think there is a ticking time bomb in the respect of that I don't think we have prepared ourselves for the challenges that will face us in that very year. And I think Sandra White, uh, made a valid point when she referred to some of the challenges that we will face at that point in housing. Uh, I think it's a valid point for her to make that in enforcing many of the challenges that have been laid out by the Minister, uh, if we face the challenges that I face as a constituency MSP almost on a weekly basis, OT assessments have to be carried out to ensure that someone's able to be released uh, back to their home, and many of those other housing challenges that have to be faced are we absolutely satisfied in this chamber that our housing organisations across uh, Scotland are preparing themselves for the decades that faces 
in the future. And I can't say with any a degree of confidence that that's absolutely the case. I'll give way to Bob Doris. Bob Doris. I, I think that's a really helpful point you make. Um, uh, earlier on in my speech, I was trying to make the point that, you know, sometimes having that OT assessment take place on a Saturday morning might be more important than an extra nurse on a Friday afternoon. I know it's not either or, but do you agree we have to get a bit more sophisticated, a bit more workforce planning and management at a local level? Paul Martin. And Pazain, also, I think, again, uh, Bob Doris raises the practical realities that are in place. It's all very well for us to pass this legislation. It looks very good on paper. Uh, it looks good in a document that's presented to the Integration Board. I'm sure they will have a number of acronyms to, to describe what these boards are meant to do. But when it comes down to the ensuring that this is enforced and ensuring that the experience of those constituents and their various constituencies and regions, regions throughout Scotland is enforced, I think that will be the proof in whether this legislation's actually been effective or not. I uh, can also uh, highlight to the, to the Chamber uh, the briefing that we have received from uh, Marie Curie Scotland and can I uh, put on record and commend the good work uh, of Marie Curie Scotland. Uh, there will be very few members, if any, uh, in this Chamber who have not been touched uh, by the good work of Marie Curie. Uh, I do not think we recognise uh, as often as we should their good work and how effective that their work is in ensuring that people can be. Uh, discharged from hospital and at the end of life experience uh, is as effective as it should be. But they do in their uh, uh, briefing provide uh, a number uh, of points uh, that I think were extremely helpful and they make the point that so often uh, that 60% of those with a terminal illness would prefer to die at home. Now I think, I think that figure actually could be higher than that. I think there are a number of people who don't even say that they want to uh, find themselves in that position because they don't think the support will be in place in the first place. Uh, so I think the challenge for us is ensuring that some of the points that in this one point and many others that were raised by Marie Curie again are faced up to and we challenge that uh, figure to ensure that those who want to die at home that we put in place an effective package to ensure that that end of life uh, uh, provision is provided at that, that, at that point. So I'd just say in conclusion, President Officer, once again, this has been a constructive debate. I've spoken many constructive debates in this chamber, uh, but it can only be effective if we ensure that the enforcement of this is taken forward and that we actually monitor this legislation and come back to this legislation at a very early stage, I would suggest, to ensure that the integration boards are doing uh, what they were set out to do. Thank you very much. We still do have some time in hand for interventions, if members care to take them. Christina McKelvey to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can, can I start off by agreeing with Paul Martin and his very eloquent words and how we can all work together? Because the mechanics and the tools and the people who actually deliver the new integration boards are crucial to the success of its approach. Um, and the Scottish Government, I know, is well aware that proper financial resources need to be available, and everybody's made that case today, but I'm sure they're taking care of that. But of course, it's not all about the money. As well as the undoubted commitment already in place through COSLA, the health boards and local authorities working for the benefit of the people of Scotland, we need to make sure we extend those improvements beyond the immediate core of integrating adult health and social care, community health and some acute services. With any substantial initiative that changes management structures, we need to be careful to avoid the traditional risks which are financial wastage, inadequate or poorly positioned staffing arrangements, and being on the unison side of many, an integration and change to an establishment, then having the staff in the right place at the right time is always very beneficial to the smooth uh, changeover. And then there could be the danger of neglecting the stakeholder groups. I don't think there has been dan danger of that here, because I think, uh, given the amount of briefings that we've all had sent to us, you can see there's excellent engagement from stakeholder groups. Presiding officer, I fully respect that something like this isn't going to happen as a nice, neat overnight package. We would love it if it did. But then I think my mammy used to say nothing worth doing was ever easy. So different joint integration boards will probably introduce the system in slightly different ways, but it will be important to ensure that consistency in the delivery of the services is paramount. The vital elements include stakeholder engagement, as I mentioned earlier, clinical and care governance arrangements, workforce and organisational development, data sharing, 
financial management, dispute resolution at earliest opportunity, and the particular local arrangements for each board. It is on the theme of stakeholder engagement that I would like to concentrate my remarks today. As colleagues are already aware, I have been involved in representing the interests of motor neuron disease sufferers for many, many years now. The Neurological Alliance of Scotland, who have a stall just right outside the chamber, um, have been testing all our neurons with their tests this week. I'm pleased to say I get nine and a half out of ten. Um, I didn't believe that smoking was good for you if you had Parkinson's disease, but there you go. Um, yeah, of course. It was Thanks actually out of, There were actually 12 questions. <gasps> <laughs> Christina McKelvey. <laughs> they told me I get nine and a half out of ten. I obviously missed the, pay, the ones around the page. <laughs> I'll go back and do it again. <laughs> Push me right back down the list then. Here's me. I sat, thought I was sitting second top there. <laughs> Anyway, the, the Neurological Alliance of Scotland is the umbrella body of organisations and groups representing people affected by a neurological condition such as motor neuron disease. And NAS points out, and I quote, living with a neurological condition can be a huge challenge for individuals and their families and friends. Neurological conditions are often complex, highly individual and impact on several aspects of a person's life. It's important that everyone involved is able to access the NHS, care and community support that is right for them, throughout their life with any condition that they face. And the authors add that integration has to be about people rather than structures. And it seems so obvious that it shouldn't need saying, yet it is an omnipresent danger that bringing organisational change to a big entity, two big beasts, as Gil Patterson described them, we would never and should never lose sight of the fact that it's for the end users that these services are directed. The end users are real individual people with their individual needs and we must never ever forget that. Person-centred care is exactly what integration is designed to deliver. And I actually am concerned a bit less about what it currently takes in rather than what it leaves out. And neurology services will not be integrated within the compulsory requirements demanded by the legislation. And I know that it is a work in motion. I think that is a missed opportunity. As, the, as NAS put it, and I quote again, this means that most people with long-term or degenerative neurological conditions will receive their ongoing neurological care, including outpatient care, solely from the NHS. Meanwhile, social, community and primary care will be delivered via the local integrated health and social care partnerships. It is, I fear, an example of what we need to avoid where structures become more important than patients. Unplanned admissions to neurology wards account for 54% of all admissions, which is short of the 85% threshold required. But the percentage is misleading. Most people with neurological conditions won't be admitted to a specific neurology ward from accident emergency. They are much more likely to be on a general medical ward because of issues like a fall or an infection. The driver behind integration of health and social care needs to be breaking down barriers so as to help people access more person-centred care. And NAS fears that unless the spirit of integration prevails across all services and not just those that are subject to formal integration, those whose care is delivered in non-integrated services will see little change in their care. I would hope we prove NAS wrong on that. In other words, to make this work, partnerships need to be between the NHS, community, social care, third sector and people, more importantly, the people who are receiving those care services. In a society where people increasingly suffer, suffer from a multi multiplicity of different conditions and where each person's home situation has a real impact for good, but sometimes for bad, upon their physical health, we need to grasp this opportunity now. So let us not then use the legislation as an end result. Rather, let us use it as a framework upon which to build stronger, better and more patient-focused services than the current structures allow. In my 19-year career in social care, a career where a few years into that I first met the Cabinet Secretary, um, we didn't meet through politics, we actually met through our profession, then she knows just as well as me that a big change to win buy-in and support from those who work in it and those who use the services, we need to show that the outcomes are going to work. 
So with the imaginative approach and the cooperative approach that I think we are taking in this chamber today, and I know that all the organisations are taking to ensure this work, I think we have the tools and we have the people, and more importantly, we have the will to make this happen for those who need it, the people who are the end users, the people who need the services. Thanks. Thank you very much. I, I did remind members that there is some time in hand for interventions, but could I also remind members who are making interventions to address the remarks through the chair, because if they turn away from their microphones, then unfortunately I can't hear them. But worse than that, the official report perhaps will not pick up the points that they're making. It's more difficult for them to do so. Um, I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, it has been uh, mentioned on a number of occasions today, and Christina McKelvey, my colleague, um, uh, concluded on this point, that this debate should be about people and not structures. However, much of the material produced on the subject by a range of organisations, it has to be said, is heavy on, on jargon and light on the human touch. Now, of course, we do need to get the management and operational structures correct, and there's no getting away from the fact that this is a very complex process involving a wide variety of organisations and professionals with different cultures and different management styles. But at the end of the day, we are doing this for people, often vulnerable people, and everyone involved in this process must focus on their care, their needs and their individual wishes, including ourselves, politicians. And that's why I welcome the very specific focus on individuals and their well-being in the core suite of indicators published today by the Scottish Government. Uh, I welcome the fact that they're person-centred outcomes and are based on feedback from those whose lives this change is meant to improve. And I welcome the scale of their ambition. The government has set a high bar, which could be described as courageous, particularly given the financial pressures we face in delivering public services, something underlined in the budget yesterday, which again confirmed another 30 billion of deeper cuts to come. It's in this context that we view the outcomes published by the Scottish Government. It tells us what success looks like. It will be judged on the percentage of adults, for example, able to look after their health very well or quite well, the percentage supported at home who agree they're supported to live as independently as possible, who agree their health and care services are well coordinated and can be described as excellent or good. There are 10 such indicators published today based on feedback and another 13 indicators based on administrative data, which are no less ambitious or indeed person-centred, because, of course, behind every statistic there is a human being. These statistical indicators include judging success by reducing premature mortality, emergency hospital admissions, and, of course, readmissions after discharge. And it also measures the number of falls, the percentage of adults with intensive needs receiving care at home, the quality of care in care homes, and the amount of expenditure on end-of-life care. There are 23 such outcomes, and it's vital that we keep a close eye on every single one of them. I therefore welcome the establishment by the Scottish Government of the Person-Centred Health and Social Care Collaborative, which brings health and social care together to help roll out best practice right across Scotland. This is particularly important given that these changes will take place at a local and ideally at a community level, and while, of course, we expect national standards of care, different communities will take different approaches. Um, in the south of Scotland, in Dumfries and Galloway, for example, the current local authority and health board boundaries are identical. And they have therefore chosen, um, some would say, a more radical and ambitious plan for integration, perhaps uh, the most ambitious in Scotland. I have to say it has still to be approved by the full council and health board later this month. Uh, in addition to the services required through the Act to be delegated to the integrated joint board, the ambition shared in Dumfries and Galloway by the NHS board and the council is to include the entirety of acute hospital services, including facilities management and women's health services, alongside services as they relate to the provision for people under the age of 18. Full delegation of these services will also serve to alleviate any concerns. It is hoped, such as those expressed by the neurological alliances, that some services will not be part of compulsory integration of health and social care. The intention behind the proposal in Dumfries and Galloway is to ensure flexibility 
and full accountability for the effective deployment of resources to enable the integrated system to focus on the whole health and social care pathway and the ability to redesign right across the system. I very much welcome that, it, very much hope it will be a success and offer models to best practice uh, to other parts of Scotland. A number of members, I was pleased to hear, um, raised the issue of the third sector. And uh, I have, uh, in preparation for this debate, been speaking to David Coulter, uh, Chief Officer of Third Sector Interface in Dumfries and Galway. Um, the interface has an excellent relationship with their community planning partnerships and is fully committed to and engaged in the integration agenda locally. The interface recently got agreement from the Integration Programme Board to fund posts that will enable them to have staff dedicated to this particular policy agenda. Uh, the money will come from the Integrated Care Fund announced by the Scottish Government in July last year. And this is, of course, welcome and demonstrates a real desire amongst public sector partners to work with the third sector. However, funding is for one year only, and so it is difficult to make plans beyond March next year, um, which is a, a challenge third sector organisations often face at, um, at local level. Perhaps Scottish ministers could give some guidance and direction to the joint boards in relation to resources that will be required uh, for the third sector to effectively fulfil its role. Can I also, in the context of talking about the third sector, take this opportunity to also commend the briefing from Marie Curie and their comments on effective partnership working. The third sector is extremely wide and varied with different organisations able to offer different levels of support and services. Marie Curie make the point that they have been widely recognised for their expertise in designing and delivering palliative and end-of-life care. Uh, they should be involved in the co-design of services, even if they do not actually sit on the joint boards. Uh, the consultation with the third sector has to be deeper and wider than simply having the interface sitting on a board and organisations with a specific expertise like Marie Curie should be consulted directly. Thank you very much. Many thanks and I now call Elaine Murray to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think uh, one of my concerns in taking part in in this uh, debate was not only would I have an extra seven minutes or so generous timing, uh, but that somebody would already have spoken about one of the things that I want to, spoke about, to speak about, which was the radical uh, proposals from the Dumfries and Galloway area. Uh, and Joan McAlpine has already uh, described part of that. So obviously that's taking a little bit out of my speech also. Um, I think it's important, as uh, Joan McAlpine said, to realise that uh, there isn't agreement agreement that does have to be got from the, the Council, the Health Board, and ultimately from the Scottish Government. But I think it is a, an interesting proposal, uh, and I, I, I think it has to be commended. It was, of course, uh, easier for a solution of this time to be developed in Dumfries and Galloway because of the co-terminosity of the Council and the Health Board. Uh, and I think it is easier, obviously, for two organisations to deal with each other rather than uh, one council with several health boards or one health board with several councils, uh, which, which is obviously a more difficult thing. But uh, you know, what, one of the exciting things, actually, is that the health board uh, and the council are going to transfer some £300 million of resource budget if this goes through, and that actually is, is, is fairly significant. And they're doing so because uh, the Health and Social Care Partnership Board believe that actually that sort of major transfer actually offers the best chance of real change and also of devolution of decision-making to localities. And that's actually important in a large rural area like Dumfries and Galloway. So it means that sort of locality management would, would occur in the four area committee regions of Dumfries and Galloway. And although the assets would remain with the health board, decisions over implementation of the capital programme, for example, would rest with the locality board and that there will also be uh, dem democratic accountability uh, through the area committees. And of course, uh, the model could extend further if it's successful. There could be further extensions of this model. Now, I think Kenny McCaskill uh, made an important point, I think, about the potential threat to criminal justice social work, for example. I think there's also an opportunity in there as well and in terms of looking at how well these services managing to work together is there are other opportunities. And if you're looking at things like criminal justice social work, there's a need for agencies uh, and the third sector for uh, two to work together uh, to tackle things like reoffending and also to look at things like how you actually stop young people getting involved, people who are under threat, if you like, from getting involved in the criminal justice sector. Uh, 
a service is or, or, or a system uh, that how agencies work together to provide those services to prevent people from, from getting involved. So I think there's actually, as we take these forward, there's a lot of opportunity for other service providers and other services to actually to learn from the experience of integrated care. Uh, I think also the, mo the model which has been developed could be uh, of particular benefit to, to in communities. Now, I know in Langham, in my, uh, in my constituency, the health board and the council have already been working together to try and, and, and the private sector provider to try and uh, tackle the issue where there is strong support for the Thomas Hope Hospital, but it's not really a modern hospital. It's an old, old fashioned community hospital. It's not really up to what's required now. Uh, the only privately owned care uh, home closed down because it refused to take on board recommendations of the care inspector, inspector over a prolonged period of time. And there's also a shortage of suitable housing for an ageing population. Now, these discussions have been going on for a long time, but I think the implementation of the integrated joint board will help to bring the, the, the solution. It does look as if a solution is there, uh, and it will help to bring that solution forward. Um, so it, it means an, an ability to develop local solutions for, for the needs of local communities. Um, the way in which social work services, GP services, community hospitals are, can be managed locally should have the flexibility to respond to need and the combined budget should mean that problems such as delayed discharge can be tackled across the services. But having said that, in my area, in this area, uh, delayed discharge isn't just about people not being wanting to pay, pay for care home places. It's not quite as simple as that. Parts of Andale and Nithsdale, in fact, and parts of Nithsdale, Upper Nithsdale as well. Delayed discharge is often caused by uh, actually an acute shortage of care providers, not because anybody's unwilling to take on uh, provision of services, but actually the care services just aren't there. Um, and that is in some of the towns and villages, the majority of the cases certainly that's come to me with those sorts of problems around the discharge is actually we haven't got the services there. So there are issues to be addressed in terms of you know, the payment that actually care workers have, the respect for care workers actually promoting that uh, as, a, uh, a, a, as a career. Um, and so obviously the £3.4 million pounds which was announced in January uh, for Dumfries and Galloway IGB is very welcome, but it's not going to solve it immediately. It's not going to immediately solve the problem. There is other work to be done and there will be challenges that the IGB obviously will uh, have to f f uh, face in, in, in trying to solve some of these issues. But I think that one of the things that I'm excited about is that actually it's only five years since the closure of most of the community hospitals in my constituency, Langham, Lock Maven, Moffat, Thornhill, uh, and the centralisation of services in Annan and Dumfries was being proposed by the Health Board. And Jim Hume will remember that. He led a members debate five years ago on that issue, and I think the consultant behind him came and paid him a visit, he paid me a visit, and more or less told us that politicians should keep their noses out because they didn't understand the issues. Uh, well, actually, I think we, uh, those of us who were involved said, well, I, you know, we are re representing our constituents in doing that. So, you know, I think there's been a tremendous amount of Progress when we got to the, from, from the position five years ago where you know, community facilities were being closed, where we're now actually going to have locality management of those community facilities. Now, that's not going to mean to say it's easy. You know, it's going to be difficult decisions. Andale and Estee will inherit area will have four community hospitals. Now, there's going to be difficulties about how you prioritise things and for, for which communities and what takes precedence. It's not, it's not going to solve everything. But I think the important thing is nobody's going to look at it hopefully, and say, well, that's just people in Dumfries making that decision for our communities. It actually should be proper community engagement and engagement from, you know, from service users and their families as well. So I think it is exciting, uh, and um, I really look forward to seeing how it works in practice, because I think there will be a lot that can be learned uh, from how we work uh, across services, and, and uh, you know, uh, I very much welcome it. This is a very consensual debate, obviously, uh, and that's very uh, uh, gratifying in itself. But I think there is a lot as we go forward and see as the IGBs become established over the next year and then actually start taking over the work, that I think there will be a lot of interesting things that we can learn and that we will also be able to apply probably across services into other areas of ser service provision as well. Thank you very much. Before I call our final open debate speaker, can I indicate to the Chamber that there are members missing from the Chamber who have participated in the debate, so I would encourage them to return to the Chamber for closing speeches as Richard Lyle is now our final open debate speaker. Mr Lyle, I can give you seven minutes or so. Thank, thank you, President Officer. It's unusual for me to be last and, and get the full seven minutes. Generally, it's cut down to four or either three or two. 
or, or even none at all. Uh, it happened to be a couple of weeks ago. Well, in um, this happy, Mr Lyle, on this happy occasion, I can give you extra time. Yes, I am more than pleased to take the extra time. Um, thank you, President Officer. Can I, get, uh, I begin this afternoon by saying how pleased I am to speak in this important debate on health and social care integration. I'm particularly delighted to speak as a member of this Parliament's Health and Support Committee, and I thank all organisations for their briefings. Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Bill was passed by this Parliament in February 2014. The Bill finally puts in place the framework for integrated health and social care here in Scotland and is one which has received widespread uh, and cross-party support in this Parliament. And I am very happy to hear this afternoon that it is still the same. The Bill allows health boards and local authorities to integrate health and social care services in two ways, which continues the approach by this Government in its efforts to devolve decision-making further by allowing health boards and local authorities to agree which approach is best for local needs. First option available to local authorities is delegating the responsibility for planning, resourcing, service provision for adult health and social care services to an integration joint board. This board will include health and social care professionals, the third sector, users, carers and other key stakeholders. The very minimum is that the health boards and local authorities must delegate, broadly speaking, as adult social care services, adult community health services and a proportion of adult acute services. As I am sure those in the Chamber know, it will be at the discretion of the local partners to decide whether to integrate children's services either now or at some point in the future. In order to achieve the best possible results, health boards and local authority must involve and engage their key stakeholder in the development of a draft integration scheme and will take into account the views and opinions expressed during this process. The second integration model option available to local authorities involves either the health board or the local authority taking a lead responsible for planning, resourcing and delivering integrated health, adult health and social care services in their area. As with one, option one, the lead agency can decide to include children's services in the integration programme either now or at a future date. The chief executive of the lead agency will have the responsibility to develop the strategic plan for the integrated services and is required to set up a strategic planning group. We have the advantage of strategic plans for older people services already being in place in every partnership area in Scotland, which will provide a good starting place for this work ensuring that plans should be fit for purpose as possible regardless of whatever integration option is adopted by a local authority. Integration is an ambitious programme of reform to improve services for people who use health and social care services. Integration will ensure that health and social care provision across Scotland is joined up, seamless, especially for people with long-term conditions and disabilities, many of whom who are older people. To this end, the Scottish Government has announced that an additional resource of £100 million will be made available to health and social care partnerships 2015-16. This money is being provided to support delivery, to improve outcomes for health and social care integration, help drive the shift towards prevention and to further strengthen this Government's approach to tackling inequalities. I wonder if the member would give way. Certainly. But Bob Doris. Just when you, you mentioned the hundred. Mr. Doris, sorry. Apologies, Thank you very much. Officer, yes, indeed. Um, just when you mentioned the hundred million pound that we built in 2015-16, do, do you believe that additional two hundred pounds over the subsequent two years that's been announced today gives the in, was hundred million for 15-16 and two hundred million for the following two years? That gives local boards the opportunity to not think in the short term but a long-term strategic approach and consistent funding over a longer period of time. I Richard Lyle. I certainly agree with Mr Doris, and it's £200 million, not £200. <laughs> you said £200. Uh, the £100, the 100 million being provided will build upon the reshaping care of older people change fund, which has been a powerful lever to support the third sector. NHS, local authorities, amongst others, to work more effectively together and to share ownership of the local change plans and delivery. The new Integrated Care Fund will be accessible to local partnerships to support investment in the integrated services for all, all adults. The funding will support partnerships to focus on prevention, early intervention and care and support for older people with complex and multiple conditions. It is important that we continue with the health and social care integration as a country because the people of Scotland are living longer, healthier lives, which is great news, meaning that the needs of our society are changing and so the nature and form of our public services must change along with them. 
Over the last 10 years, overall life expectancy has increased in Scotland, and our older population is likely to increase around two-thirds in the next 20 years, as most people have said this afternoon. We need to change, however. We need to deliver health and social care now in order to prepare, prepare for the future. Presiding officer, it is hoped by improving the quality and consistency of, our, of care for our older people that we can stop the cost shunting between councils and NHS puts results in older people languishing in hospital when they are fit enough to be sent home. And I, for one, will welcome that. To, fin to finish, presiding officer, I think it is important that this SNP government remains absolutely committed to free personal care, which delivers a better quality of life for older vulnerable people in Scotland. I firmly believe that it is only right that older people feel fully supported to live at home or in as a homely a setting as possible within their own community for as long as possible. And the independence and the dignity in Scotland should be celebrated for older people. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now turn to closing speeches and I call on Jim Hume. Mr Hume, around seven minutes or so, there is still time in hand for interventions. So th thank you very much, uh, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I think we have a, had a, a quite consensual debate today. Uh, I think there has been good recognition that the extra £200 million pounds, uh, on top of the £100 million to help with integration has, has been welcomed from all, all, all sides. But there has been some acknowledgement that there is work to be done and, of course, there will always be work to be done. A lot has been said in this debate about the importance of incorporating all the relevant stakeholders into the implementation of health and social care, providing enough support to the communities, doctors and, very importantly, carers to achieve proper integration is a considerable task that must be planned down to the last detail from the very, very beginning. A key part of our Liberal Democrat amendment, my amendment today, recognises this and we are happy to support the Conservative amend amendment, which also reflects the need for stakeholder involvement. I want to emphasise the importance of integrating health and social care and its impact on our NHS, as members have recognised. As I mentioned earlier, we know there are concerns about the increasing pressures NHS is facing. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine expressed its grave concerns to me recently that the NHS, close, NHS is close to bending under the pressure of having, having an increasing number of patients to care for, with resources not being at the right place at the right time. And I just want to make clear to Sandra White and to Bob Doris that I absolutely celebrate that we are having more and more older people who are at, having active lives. But I think Paul Martin helped to clarify uh, matters by uh, stating that, you know, it, there is still that uh, pressure from uh, having an ageing population. And for, for the record, in, in uh, 23 years' time, I'll be a part of the 75-plusers. Uh, so let's be clear, by the quarter uh, October to December 2014, there was nearly 170,000 bed days uh, lost by delayed discharge patients. The majority of them, more than 100,000 bed days, were occupied by those patients aged 75 and over. And we know that since 2010, geriatric beds have been cut by a third. So that's, there's, there's a misbalance there. Bed blocking and lack of beds is causing uh, jams in, in our systems. There are too many people who are uh, ready to go home who are still in hospitals as, as we speak today. As of January of this year, there were 3,000 patients waiting to be discharged. These waits extend to more than six weeks. This is no good uh, uh, for patients or, of course, very importantly, for staff morale. There are also, yeah, at that point, yes. Bob Doris, Thanks. Bob Doris, microphone, please. I've seen 23 years, uh, Mr. Hume will be a time bomb. Um, I'm put, put that on, on, on the record. But just in terms of the delayed discharge and the serious point you're, you're making, there, there, there are significant challenges to a number of professions, including allied health professionals, to change their working patterns, be they physiotherapists, OTs, or indeed clinicians such as pharmacists. I believe they're all up for it, but do you agree with me there could be significant changes in working patterns required to, to, to assuage the pressures of delayed discharge going forward? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. absolutely. We have to look at how, how everybody works. I know the government's working on this. We have to look at... GP practices as well, I think, uh, and that may not be that popular with many, but uh, we have to look at uh, changes in, in opening times, uh, perhaps. Um, there are hundreds of people, I think, waiting, of course, more than 12 hours in A&E units. Uh, that's because of some of these shortages, and we know that A&E admissions for older people 
older people are also at an all-time high. So with that in mind, Liberal Democrats are also happy to support the Labour Amendment and we look to the Cabinet Secretary for some assurances that she will indeed keep true to her word, as I'm sure she will, on the commitment to end uh, block bed blocking. So from terminal uh, diseases, heart conditions, neuro neurological illnesses uh, mentioned by Christina McKelvey and mental illnesses to other physical conditions, the smooth transition from care establishment of uh, care in a community environment is the holistic approach that experts have been arguing um, exponentially uh, on uh, to improve a person's health. This is why we want to see meaningful engagement with the specialists in uh, the community. We want to see real support for GPs, carers and nurses, but also for the family members who are taking care of their loved ones. Uh, I think, uh, as, this, as others have said, like John McAlpine, this must be uh, person-centred, which is why involving primary and secondary care clinicians is fundamental to have an all-rounded input into the right uh, direction of community care. And, uh, as I said, the carers have been mentioned. Uh, I think it's also, of course, vital that we look after them, uh, as they're the ones who will be delivering very much of th this. And I think we should maybe look at uh, career structures for carers and see if they can progress their, uh, uh, their careers within the N NHS and, and towards uh, uh, local authorities as well. So uh, we can see ways of perhaps giving them a more of a career structure, which might be uh, an interesting approach. The implementation of a successful integration of health and social care is a major task for stakeholders. We welcome the government's announcement, as I said, to allocate that extra £200 million funding over the years. Uh, we can't afford to leave this major project underfunded at a time when we know that there is an ageing population, more people having to live with multiple complex and long-term conditions. Integration of health and social care isn't a static uh, process, and like Paul Martin, I would support Marie Curie's calls for regular reporting, particularly on palliative end and end-of-life care services. I think we must look to preventative measures, especially as targets to our older population in their homes. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could confirm today if part of the budget will be allocated for housing adaptations and aids that will allow, allow people to live independently. I note the Health Secretary's announcement today talks about telehealth and building up mental health care capacity. Uh, I welcome these things. There is a severe lack of service provision for children, adult and older people's mental health services. And I, I need to remind the Health Secretary that uh, treatment times of mental health are uh, being missed. So to this end, Lib Dems believe that the Health Secretary and her ministers should take that bold step that I have mentioned about uh, enshrining in law parity between mental health and physical health. That move would uh, be a clear signal that the government is taking mental health uh, seriously. And I know the Cabinet Secretary will not be surprised that I will be mentioning that. So it is vital that we focus our attention on alleviating pressures we know exist in the NHS to allow staff to do their jobs and patients to get the care they need. Integration will be key in achieving this uh, by ensuring that the NHS and local partner authorities work uh, together. Elaine Murray mentioned Dumfries and Galloway Community Hospitals. That's quite correct. I did have a members' debate on that very subject here. And within a day or two off that, the Dumfries and Galloway Council did uh, withdraw their, their uh, sorry, not that council, uh, NHS, I should say, uh, withdraw their consultation. And you're quite right. That clinician actually said into my office, hell mend you if this doesn't go through. So hell will have to mend me. Presiding officer, as we approach the 1st of April, the, the role of the new joint body should be to develop care strategies not, in a by, uh, listening to their not by listening to their constituent authorities and various stakeholders and responding to their needs. Similarly, the role of the minister must not be to dictate to the government positions, but to assist in delivering optimum outcomes. There is still much work to be done, as members have recognised, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will, take, uh, will respond to the issues raised in today's debate. And as said, we shall support all amendments and the motion today. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Jackson Carlaw. Seven minutes or so, Mr Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I agree. If I were to leave it at that, I realise it might not be entirely helpful to the Chair, but it has been an afternoon in which I think there has been a great deal of consensus. And it's clear that the unprecedented number of representations we've received have been drawn upon by members all across the chamber in informing the debate that has taken place. And I want to therefore 
make some specific points um, as well as some general ones. But I have to say, presiding officer, it's been itching my conscience all afternoon since Bob Dorsey's intervention in which he told us that poor Mr. Tommy Taylor on his 100th birthday had the highlight of being visited by Mr. Doris. <laughs> and I simply wanted an assurance from Mr. Doris that there were greater treats in store for him as the day wore on. And I would really wish to give him the opportunity to, to reassure me. Bob Doris. Uh, just to, uh, he, he was very pleased. He was having a celebratory lunch uh, this afternoon and a surprise party tonight, so shush, don't be telling anyone. But I did also give him a bottle of malt whisky signed by the First Minister. I'm sure when you reach your 100th birthday, Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister, will do the same. Jackson Carlo. I think that's quite marvellous. And to know that the duty had been cut on that bottle as well would be a great boost to Mr Taylor as well, I'm, I'm quite sure. Um, uh, can I only put on record, presiding officer, that were I fortunate enough to live to be of that venerable age, I wish no visit from my local MSP uh, on, that, on that occasion. It was otherwise quite a saintly contribution from Mr Doris because he was quietly admonishing those of us who feel that maybe another thousand nurses for the health service might be useful, funded by one mean or another. And I only hope that were the government next year to come forward with a similar proposal, Mr Doris will be equally circumspect at that point and wondering whether that really is nothing more than just a headline that's being advanced at that time, but I'll wait and see. What, of course, brought him to his feet was the intervention, uh, the, the comment from Mr Hume, um, of a time bomb. Now, I don't look at Doctors Milne and Simpson and think that there is a ticking time bomb. There is a challenge, certainly, for the population ageing that we have. But I understand and I sympathise with Mr Hume. A ticking time bomb is obviously something very much on the minds of Liberal Democrats as we <laughs> move forward to the general election, although I was a little concerned to hear Mr Martin publicly acknowledge the ticking time bomb metaphor as well. I wondered whether that presaged something too. But this is a hugely important challenge, the whole challenge of health and integrated care. It's had the support across the chamber and through the health committee in all the stages that it's been discussed. But the great challenge is that it is being discussed in an NHS which is built on a sea of shifting sands at the present time. Because it's not just this one enormous challenge and all the complexities that are associated with it. It's the fact that in primary and secondary care and preventative care, in mental health, in palliative care, there is a growing recognition that something very substantial and very significant needs to change there too. And so this challenge sits not just in isolation, uh, but with all the competing challenges that will be facing the health service at the present time. When I was visiting a, an A&E department last week, they said to me, you know, it's great this uh, social care if the patient presents Monday to Thursday, 9 till 4. But actually, if the patient presents after that, well, then we've got a problem because we don't have or seem to have the apparatus beyond the A&E department in hospitals or out there with social work to be able to put together the kind of package that's necessary. There's one of the big challenges. Um, another um, is, I suppose, my mother's example, and she'll not thank me for mentioning it, but she was in hospital recently, um, and you know, her GP knew nothing about it, that she'd been in repeatedly. Uh, when she came out, we tried to get an appointment with the GP whose secretary said, well, if she's been discharged from hospital, she can't need to see the doctor. And the earliest appointment was five days hence, in which she was at home really in what I felt a completely unsuitable condition. When the doctor finally came, I have to say something was done. But when she was in hospital, nobody gave me a leave. I thought, what are we, how are we going to organise any kind of support? Well, nobody discussed it. And I eventually had to rake through old drawers and open up the yellow pages and find something. And I thought, well, I've got the wits to do that. But there must be lots of people, despite everything we say about the excellent experience that many people will enjoy, there'll be lots of people who haven't got the wits who will actually find themselves floundering in a situation which is completely avoidable and totally unacceptable. And I think that's another of the challenges. Yeah, Dr. Simpson. Dr. Simpson. Thank you. Thank you for giving way. Um, he may be interested to know we are just completing a freedom of information inquiry which is aimed at, at determining how many social workers are actually cited in the acute hospitals. And it is quite surprising how many of our acute units have no social workers actually based there. So his point is well made. 
Um, I would like to thank both Paul Martin and Sandra White for raising an issue that I have brought up in debates before, which is the whole question of housing as we go forward. Because it is not just um, social housing, it is not just housing associations. What we have to have now within planning is a recognition that we are enjoying a population who are going to live to a far greater age, but who want to stay within their community and want to be independent within their community. Uh, somebody said to me, I don't want to go somewhere where the only conversation the following morning is who survived the night. Um, and I understand how they feel. I, Thursday afternoons quite often I feel that way myself. But we need to ensure that people are able to have the option of housing within the community. And as we plan new housing, we should be planning that option too. Because that's where they'll be safe. Very often, many of the problems that arise are because they've lived too long in accommodation that was appropriate, which as they've aged has become less so, and then creates the problems that arise from that. There were lots of good contributions. I listened to John Pentland, Kenny McCaskill, Gil Patterson, Christina McKelvey. I agree very much with the point she made. Um, in relation to the Neurological Alliance. They are not part of this, but I think we want to see the same culture shift there as well, and not for people to feel that they're excluded from that. From Joan McAlpine, I think she made pertinent points, as did Paul Martin, about the whole issue of palliative care and the challenge that comes from there. We've relied very much as a nation on the generosity of so many people out there to sustain the palliative care option that we've got. And I think we are going to have to recognize that as a country, as a nation, as a government, as a state, we are going to need to contribute far more directly to that as we go forward as well. Um, and finally, I'd also like just, presiding officer, to say that your colleague John Scott, I know, is delighted uh, that North Ayrshire and Arran and the three councils there are ready uh, to take forward plans next April. This is, as I said, a NHS built in a sea of shifting sands. That's not a criticism of it. It's a reality of all the challenges that face it. Um, we have tremendous hopes, which we hope will overcome our fears, some of which were fuelled by the community health care partnership experience, where some of the goodwill that was implicit at the start ended up being eroded, and we need to ensure that doesn't happen now. But it would be naive of us not to have some fear for our hopes. This will be something that I think will not be smooth, despite all the goodwill and the expectation it will create challenges. And I think we as a, as a parliament, as a cross-party alliance in parliament on this issue, will have to step up and face up to and meet those challenges as we go forward. Many thanks. I now call in Rhoda Grant. Up to nine minutes, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we in the Scottish Labour Party support integration of health and community care. And we also believe that health must also be delivered in the community. The Scottish Government's 2020 vision states that care should be delivered at home or in a homely setting. And I think it was very clear today that the whole chamber is united around that aim. But a number of speakers pointed out, Gil Patterson and Paul Martin, that it will take much more than legislation to make that happen. It is going to need a culture change within the organisations that we are asking to integrate. It will mean an end to the buck passing that happens just now. And people need to work together with the aims of providing the best service um, to their patients and clients. We do need more skilled clinicians in the community, more GPs, more nurses, and I disagree with Bob Doris with that. But I would agree with him that we also need more uh, professionals working, allied health professionals, um, OTs, um, physiotherapists, speech therapists and the like, working in the community, supporting people at home and providing anticipated, uh, anticipated care that keeps people well and independent in their own homes. Bob Doris. I'm sure the member doesn't want to kind of misrepresent the point I was making. The point I was making is to, to focus on one discipline, which would be nursing, and not how they link into multidisciplinary teams. It might not be the visionary idea that we want for health and social care integration, so we shouldn't be simplistic about it. We're not saying more or less nurses. What we're saying is let's get the right amount of nurses, but let's make sure it's part of a multidisciplinary team and that it's all planned. Surely you would welcome that. Rhoda Grant. Indeed, and that was the point I was making, that we need all the health professionals working in the community to, to 
um, provide that kind of support. But we need to go further, I believe. We need to get consultants and specialists out of the hospitals and into the communities. And that's not always easy, but we have the ability of using things like telehealth uh, to do that, linking hospital consultants, people experts in their field with community medical and care staff. And I think that would uh, make a big difference. But we also need to empower the staff working um, in the integrated service. They need to be able to intervene quickly. They need to make decisions about care so that they prevent people going into hospital in the first place. And I think that is hugely important and where it has worked well, uh, staff on the ground have been empowered to do that. We welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to ending bed blocking by the end of the year, but as Jenny Mara said, it would be really good to see a plan of how that's going to happen and indeed to keep monitoring it because I think it's really important because there isn't a suitable care in the community just now. Elaine Murray pointed out that it's often a lack of suitable care, especially in very rural areas, that leads to people remaining in hospital and not getting out. Um, we need also step up and step down care that allows people, that prevents people going into hospital in the first place, but also speeds up their discharge home where they would have more uh, specialised care at home until they became more, more able. And I think it was um, Jenny Mara and Kenny McCaskill that talked about the, the effect of being inappropriately stuck in hospital on a person's health, de-skilling de them, disenabling them, and indeed weakening them. Um, and they're trapped there without their families around them, indeed feeling... Um, and, and they suffer the consequences of that and feel very um, disenabled and, and disempowered themselves. To do this, we also need um, to invest in our health our home care staff. We need to have a career. We need to professionalise that service. It's really important that we recognise the skills of the workforce. Uh, we need to also make sure that they are trained for the job they do and that they understand the conditions of the people they are looking after. And I was at a conference in Inverness quite recently where there was two um, home care workers. One had worked in a nursing home, one in people's homes. And they had done that for a number of years. It was only um, when they moved to work with Highland home carers had they received any specialist training in the field they were working. And they said it made a huge uh, difference, um, especially for those dealing with people with Alzheimer's. It's very important to have people cared to, uh, trained to look after them properly at home and indeed being able to use some of the, the, the technology that is there to help look after them properly, such as pressure pads, help calls and the like. A number of people talked about neurology, uh, Christina McKelvey, Malcolm Chisholm, and I think it's quite disappointing that this has been left out because I think those conditions have a huge amount uh, to benefit from having integrated care because a lot of their care will have to be provided at home and in the community to allow them to live their lives, live, live their lives properly. Um, we need to make sure care workers are paid properly. I think ensuring that they're paid the living wage um, and thereafter looking at how we compensate them for the skills and training they have is really important. We need to end the 15-minute care visit, which I think is really difficult for everybody involved, the carers and the care providers, and have proper paid breaks for, for home care workers and indeed paid travelling time between clients, because I think, especially in rural areas, that is really, really difficult. But most of all, we need to make sure um, that the care that is received by people is what is, what is required by them. Um, it has to be uh, designed by the client and indeed their family and their own care to make sure that it's indeed a person-centred. And I think that is something that we need to, to bear in mind throughout um, this whole debate, is that this has to empower people living at home. A number of people talked about the role of the voluntary sector and the third sector, both as service providers, but also as patient representatives. And I think those roles are very different um, and where they feed into the process is different, but they are absolutely crucial um, Elaine Murray and Malcolm Chisholm talked about um, locality planning um, and I think that is really important, especially for small 
third sector organisations to be involved in that, because they can bring a huge amount um, to the table that's maybe not available uniformly throughout the area, but in their localities they provide um, that service. And, you know, organisations like the um, Avi Moore and the Badenhoenstrasse Bay Car Scheme that do an awful lot more than just provide transport in that area comes to mind because they can actually keep people enabled um, within their own community. So it's really important that they are involved in that planning. A number of people um, talked about palliative care, and I think I would join with them in playing, paying tribute to the contribution of Marie Curie. And they provided us with a briefing today, as they have on many occasions um, prior to, to debates. And they've talked about, um, as Jim Hume pointed out, that 20% of non-cancer patients don't get, only get palliative care. So that's 80% of non-cancer patients receive no palliative care at all. 60% of people want to die at home, as Paul Martin said, but don't. And I think it's really important that when we're looking at this, we consider palliative care because the change fund was used to fund palliative care where it hadn't been funded before. Now, that's part of the integration funding. And I think we really need to emphasise to those integrated bodies that they need to look at how uh, they provide palliative care in the community. It was Jenny Mara who said that 400 people died in hospital waiting to go home. I'm sure most of them were waiting for palliative care at home and specialist help and indeed equipment to allow them to go home. It seems to me very wrong that people who want um, to die at home aren't given that opportunity to die with their families around them. A number of people talked about the role of GPs, and I think I mentioned we need more GPs. Um, people feel that they're not able to access their GPs, which drives them into hospital, and I think um, we need to look at their role and the role they play in the integration process as well. Um, a number of people talked about older people. Um, I don't want to use the, the phrase time bomb, and indeed some of the examples used in this chamber just say that old people, people are living longer, which is good, um, but they are also living healthier and making a contribution, and we need to celebrate yeah, that. Yeah. Could I ask you now to draw <laughs> to a close, please? Um, presiding <laughs> officer, I think, I think this debate is hugely important, and we are willing to work together with the government, but people receiving the care have to be at the centre of the debate. Many thanks. And I now call on Shona Robinson to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, ten minutes uh, till five o'clock, please. Okay, thanks, Deputy President Officer. I think it's been a very good debate, very constructive, very positive. Uh, I want to spend the time responding to as many points as I can. Um, Jenny Mara asked about the plan for tackling delayed discharge. Well, of course, that had already begun over the, the uh, winter period with the engagements with those partnerships where the problem was at its most acute. But uh, going forward, uh, I suppose to answer that in two parts. First of all, of course, the plan for tackling delayed discharge in Glasgow will be different from the Western Isles or different from Aberdeen because there are different challenges to tackle delayed discharge. Some have more developed intermediate care facilities, some have uh, more shortages of uh, care homes in other places, some have more uh, challenges in recruiting care staff than other areas. So it's very important that the plan is tailored to meet those local needs where uh, the government can help, of course, is to help those partnerships identify what works, to share best practice and to support them in the development of their local plan. And of course, that's what we are doing and will continue to do. Healthcare Improvement uh, Scotland will also work to support those improvements uh, in the localities and help those local partnerships. And of course, uh, where there will be common issues as the focus on admissions, the focus on readmissions, and making sure that uh, the, uh, the plans are robust and uh, will work. The £100 million, of course, over the next three years uh, is a significant investment to tackle delayed discharge, which will help those uh, integrated joint boards take forward those local plans. Nanette Milne. Okay, briefly. Jenny Mann. Thank Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I, I, I appreciate that the plans are local and specific and tailored. I suppose what I meant to ask the Cabinet Secretary was how will she ensure, um, as she pledged, that she will eradicate delayed discharge by the end of the year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think I've just explained that. The local partnerships will come up with the plans of how they will spend the £100 million significant amount of money 
that has been put into the system to tackle delayed discharge over the next three years, where we have the expertise through Scottish Government and through the agencies is to support them in doing that. But of course, you know, it will be the delivery of that resource locally to develop services and deliver services that will actually get people out of hospital and avoid their re readmission into hospital. So those are the local plans that will actually deliver the change. Our job is to oversee that and make sure those plans are robust and do what, what they need to do. Uh, Nanette Milne uh, talked about the engagement of GPs. Of course, the engagement of GPs is important, but as is the engagement of other health professionals, as well as the third sector and others. Uh, Jim Hume um, also talked about the, the Primary Care Development Fund, and I can assure him that discussions are uh, ongoing with for example, the Royal College of General Practitioners, who I met just the other day, who had a number of ideas about how that resource should be spent. What is important, though, is that that resource and any other resources face in the same direction as the direction of integration. What we want is for that fund to, to underpin and support uh, all of the other things that, that need to be done to make sure that we deliver uh, the, the new world of integration. Bob Doris uh, talked uh, uh, about... Uh, some of the, the pilots that have been developed through uh, that initial fund. And I think what is important is that the continuation of the fund gives the opportunity for um, a longer uh, term uh, plan. It can mean, for example, that services can be changed, staff can be recruited uh, over a longer period of time rather than a one-year fund. And I think that's why that was, that was very, in the announcement today, it was very important. Uh, he quite rightly paid tribute to the development of the intermediate care beds. We have seen a doubling of intermediate care beds, but there's more to be done. And uh, those, that is a, a good model that we want to see developed uh, in other areas as well. Malcolm Chisholm talked about uh, locality uh, arrangements and statutory guidance. Uh, first of all, the, the guidance... Um, the draft will be shared with stakeholders very shortly, so it is uh, on the cusp. Uh, we have kept in touch with partnerships throughout the last six months on the content of the scheme. Regulations on this were only passed in November, uh, so guidance is going to, to come very shortly indeed. Uh, he also made the point about the, the need for, for more involvement in integration of those other than statutory uh, representatives, and of course, that is important. The Act and the regulations assure a seat on the IGBs for clinical and professional advisors and the inclusion in the strategic planning group, which must also include the third and independent sectors and people representing, importantly, patients and service users and carers. Um, Sandra White made a very, very important point, um, and that is the issue of housing. And she's absolutely right. So um, I have been in discussion with, the, with Alec Newell, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights, about bringing forward uh, a joint approach on housing to support integration. And we'll make an announcement about that shortly. Um, Kenny McCaskill, I thought, also made an important point about criminal justice social workers. Uh, and the... Um, the they could be, they're on the maybe integrated list, so they're not excluded, they're on the maybe integrated list. And we are working closely with the, uh, those officials working on the forthcoming criminal justice social work bill to ensure alignment. And I think the points he's made, I'll make sure, are fed in um, and uh, that they're captured because it, it was an important point. Christine McKelvey and others um, spoke about the uh, neurological alliance and some of the uh, points and concerns raised by them. I think on the basis of what's been said today, I would be happy to look again at the, uh, the, the issue, given the close links to other groups and some of the points made. Um, so I think we can do that in short order and make sure that the concerns that members have raised today and of the Neurological Alliance are taken on board and are uh, addressed. Uh, Paul Martin made a related point about you know, some of the practicalities on the, the, uh, to, a similar point to, to Sandra White around getting someone home sometimes actually is about an OT assessment. Of course, uh, it is uh, within the integrated uh, care uh, resources that they could use that resource to make sure that there is more of that. And again, it is 
there to address local issues. And if that is a shortage around getting those assessments done, then that is clearly should be a priority uh, for that local partnership to take forward. Um, I think Jim Hume made a, a, a similar point around adaptations. Again, there's nothing to stop those resources being used for that. It it's, again depends on what those priorities uh, are. Uh, Joan McAlpine uh, made a point about the, some of the ambitious plans that are being developed in, by Dumfries and Gallo. I would, I would acknowledge that. I think there are some very exciting um, plans emerging from the localities, and that is something that should be welcomed. In terms of guidance to help um, the, for the third sector and involvement in the third sector, I think, as I've already said, there is a requirement for the involvement of the third sector, and of course we'll be monitoring that to make sure that that is seen through on the ground in terms of their involvement. Elaine Murray asked about further integration opportunities. I've mentioned the Neurological uh, Alliance's views and the members that have raised that issue today. Uh, I think, for example, if you look at children's services, a third of the, the boards will immediately include children's services, a third plan to and there's another third who don't at the moment. And I think in the light of experience, that might be something that we move towards on a more, um, uh, um, on a basis that if, we, if, if the practices that children set, it makes sense to include children's services, then I think that's what should happen. So we will be working with the remaining third to look at how they can move forward on that issue. And I think just uh, to close, uh, presiding officer, uh, a number of people have talked about palliative care and I think this is very, very important because without a doubt the integration of health and social care I think can pr provide a much more coherent service around end of life care. And I think it's absolutely clear that many people want to spend their last few days and hours within their own home and do not want to be in a hospital environment. I think it is a duty upon all of us to make sure that a focus of the integrated uh, teams is very much about enabling that to happen. And that should be a, an early priority of them going forward. And just on uh, Jackson Carlo's point about the issue of finding care out of hours one of the things that Lewis Ritchie is looking at around the, primary, the out of hours review of primary care out of hours, of course, you can't look at that in isolation. So, of course, he's looking at other issues like the availability of care services because we do that, need that cohesion because, as we know, things happen not just in office hours and where care is needed. It's quite often not in office hours. It can be through the night. It can be at the weekend. So, again... Uh, integration will provide an opportunity for that. So uh, I'd just like to thank members for what has been a very constructive debate and also some key action points have emerged from it. So thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate on health and social care integration. We now move to the next item of business, which is decision time. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment number 12710.3 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend motion number 12710 in the name of Shona Robinson on health and social care integration be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12710.2 in the name of Nanette Milne, which seeks to amend motion number 12710 in the name of Shona Robinson on health and social care integration be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is agreed, and the amendment is agreed too. Um, the next question is amendment number 12710.1, in the name of Jim Hume, which seeks to amend motion number 12710, in the name of Shona Robinson, on health and social care integration, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that the motion 12710, in the name of Shona Robinson, as amended, on health and social care integration, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.